Good morning. Good morning. Okay, and we are live on YouTube. Hi, right. good morning and welcome to the March 22nd, 2022 public hearing and public meeting of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. We'll begin the morning by taking attendance and I'll turn it over to Mark Silverman to call the roll. Chair Carroll. Here. Vice Chair Bland. Here. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Here. Commissioner Chapin. Here. Commissioner Chen. Yeah. Commissioner Devonshire. Here. Commissioner Goldblum. Here. Commissioner Gustafson. Here. Commissioner Jefferson. Here. Commissioner Lutfi. Here. <laughs> Commissioner Holford Smith. Here. Right. Again, welcome to the March 22nd public hearing and public meeting of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. This meeting is being held via Zoom and live streamed on our YouTube channel. If you would like to testify in any of the public hearing items, please join the meeting at the estimated time shown on our public hearing agenda, which can be found on our website. And if you would just like to watch the proceedings, you may do so on our YouTube channel. We're going to begin the day with a public meeting item, which is an item that has already had a public hearing and um, has returned um, in response to commissioners' comments. And we've had um, additional comments, and they're back uh, for a third uh, try today to present a revised proposal. And then we will begin our public hearing agenda. So with that, I will turn it over to Corey Harala, our Director of Preservation, to take us through our agendas today. Hey, thank you, Sarah, and good morning, everyone. So we'll start with public meeting item number one, LPC 21-07195, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of the Bronx, block 5816, lot 1867. This is 318 College Road in the Fieldston Historic District. Uh, the lot uh, has a house built after 1953, and the application is to construct a new house on a portion of the tax lot that is to be subdivided. This was last presented at the public hearing of December 14th, I'm sorry, public meeting of March 1st, 2022. No action was taken at that time. Uh, the staff will do a brief introduction before turning it over to the architect to present the revised proposal after we open the proceedings. Okay, so let's go ahead and open the proceedings now so that can be a seamless transition. Commissioner Wellington, would you make a motion to open the proceedings? So moved. And Commissioner Devonshire, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, so the applicant may begin after the staff introduces the project. And before we get started, I'll note for the record that Commissioner Goldblum is recused on this item. Please go ahead. All right. Good morning, commissioners. Michelle Crair and preservation staff. As Corey mentioned, this item was last presented at the public meeting of March 1st, 2022. The proposal is to construct a new building on a vacant lot in a portion of a subdivided tax lot. The proposal as presented on March 1st was for a building fronting on College Road with a two-story massing adjacent to the road and a setback third story, featuring stucco, schist, and red cedar cladding, red-brown windows, a cedar-clad crowning element at the rooftop terrace, and white railings at rooftops and rear decks and stairs. A majority of the commissioners present expressed support for the revised massing presented at the meeting, as well as the introduction of stucco and schist cladding materials, and several expressed support for a contempor contemporary or modernist design. However, some commissioners present expressed concerns about the materiality and presence of the crowning element, that the side facade featured too large and expansive stucco cladding, that the color of the windows may clash with the cedar cladding as it ages, and that the railings and staircase at the rear facade would call undue attention to themselves when seen from Tibbet Avenue. The applicant has returned to present the revised proposal. You may go ahead, Mr. Dorfman. Oh. Just uh, okay. Um, there you go. Um, just a second. Wh which is the button that I push to be able to scroll through the? Kyle, you just need to click on your screen, and then you'll have control of the presentation. Got it. Thank Got you. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Um, good morning, commissioners. Uh, my name is Hal Dorfman. Um, I'm presenting you. Um, for the third um, try um, to obtain approval 
of a new house located on College Road. This is in a, um, a zoning lot adjacent to the present owner's property to the south. Um, just a quick review of the zoning on this project. We have um, uh, reduced the massing of the house as per the original design. Um, we were asking city planning for two modifications of which they're supportive of uh, for the side yard as well as the coverage. We have reduced the coverage to the complying 12 and a half percent. So that modification will no longer be needed. We've also reduced the floor area of the house significantly, probably by close to more than hundreds of square feet. We've eliminated half of the third floor as well as um, the rooftop um, uh, penthouse, which allowed access to the green roof. We now have the green roof over the second floor on the front with the boundary element known as the crown, which provides the defining element between the top of the building and the sky as seen from the street, as well as from the occupants who use um, the new um, roof terrace green roof. Um, we've also increased the size of the front yard. Um, it was before 36 feet, now it's 40 feet, which is double uh, the required front yard. So the house is well set back and sighted from the street. By sighting it uh, further back from the front uh, lot line on uh, College Road, it affords the south side of the house the maximum amount of solar gain, uh, passive solar gain, that is, um, as it um, enjoys the view of the steep slope area, which we are leaving undisturbed. Um, except for this uh, walkway that goes to uh, uh, Tibbet Avenue, because the lot does front. It's a through lot. It fronts both on College and on Tibbet. Um, I'm, I'm not going to review the siting uh, nor the, um, the street, because we've gone over this in previous hearings and meetings. Um, I'm just going slowly through it because of the scroll bar nor the precedent of the, um, the masonette style houses of the 1920s, which were the original uh, impetus for our design, the Bauhaus, Walter Gropius through La Cabousiere to Marshall Breuer, and as been suggested um, by some of the commissioners, I believe Commissioner Jefferson to look into um, Marshall Breuer's design. Um, so this, uh, this slide is a, pre a comparison of what we presented at the last meeting. There were some objections from the commissioner and I, commissioners, and I believe rightfully so, of uh, the boundary crowning element being shown in cedar, um, the thickness, the, uh, the color of the railings, the color of the windows. We've worked closely with um, Michelle Craven and, and, and Emma Waterloo, as well as uh, through them, uh, with Corey uh, Hernanda, and we've actually um, listened. We've we've shown the cedar in the new design is slightly weathered, and we've um, we've um, more closely shown the colors of the windows so that weathered cedar would relate more closely to the color that we're proposing of the windows. We've also unified um, uh, the color. Um, two or three of the commissioners. Um, brought out that the white railing was a little bit too stark and in, and in too much in contrast with the natural area of the trees around it. So we've actually unified, and you'll see in, in, in other uh, renderings that we have of the site, how we've unified the color of all the metal elements um, on all sides of the home. Um, additionally, by looking at it now, the massing of the house is quite in proportion to all the elements. Um, and Commissioner Shamir Barone uh, from our original design talked about the constraints of the modular design. And we've, we've, we, from our original design, which was aluminum rain screen, we've brought the materials of the project into the sympathy with other materials in the district by using, as Michelle brought up before, um, stucco in a, a sand finish, um, cedar, the wood material, which is used predominantly on many homes. We also are using uh, the more native stone to the area, the Manhattan schist. And that, that stone element uh, anchors the house to the ground. 
Um, the lighter the, the the colors go from darker to lighter as the house um, rises and meets the sky. Um, we believe now that the boundary element of of the roof terrace uh, green roof is a much more lighter element, which actually completes the overall design of the house. Um, and as you can see, it's it's a much more unified. Um, simpler design uh, in the modernist vocabulary, which is now um, close to 100 years old as an architectural style. Um, proceeding to the next slide, which is the east facade of the house. As you can see, um, there are many trees which we've ghosted out. And this is um, an image that would only really take place possibly for about four months of the year. This is a heavily wooded area of the site. This is the steep slope area of the site. And we have changed the design from a, a switchback stair to one which is more influenced by Marshall Breuer, a straight run stair with cantilevered treads uh, from the stone wall. And we've simplified the railing design slightly and we've unified the color of the, uh, of the elements of the windows and the railings and um, um, the trim of the balcony. And as, as you can see, it's more harmonious with the natural area of the site as looking up from Tibbet Road. This next view um, is an excellent um, showing of how the house looks as you come up the block from the south as you walk north of College Road. It shows the house in scale to um, the, the family's present home and uh, in relationship the distance to the next house to the north. Um, it shows the distance back from the curb. Um, it shows the unification of all the colors and how it might look in a few years if um, the owners do not keep the cedar in a pristine condition as it might weather slightly. We've also addressed, um, one of the commissioners had a concern about uh, the massing on the side of the house, which is this area on the side of the house um, is, is not, at this moment, in this one step, you will see it as you progress up the side, but normally you would, you would really see the house um, straight on from the street as you walk across, sorry. Just a second. Um, um, so um, we can, I can answer any questions about the materials later uh, and how we've come up to this, um, what I believe is, as an artist would say, the last stroke necessary to complete the painting. Um, uh, we've gone over this before. Here you can see the comparison. We've lowered the height of the house by changing the structural system from a reinforced concrete system to a metal frame system, which allowed us to reduce the overall floor to floor height on all, three, on all three floors by close to four feet. Um, uh, this was the previous design that you saw. This is the new design um, showing how um, the windows create an alignment and, and uh, by closure a band. We've also um, put a small sunscreen element in keeping with the um, a sun shading element for the windows in keeping with the colors of the other materials. Um, you've seen this before. Um, one of the commissioners pointed out that uh, the renderings did not um, align with, um, they, they showed more of a rectilinear cut of the stone, but the stone will be a little bit more of a natural cut. Um, the cedar, um, the color of the windows, the type of railing, the accent of the cedar in relation to the windows and the proportion of the windows to the whole. Um, we've reduced um, the coverage, and you should note that in an R12 that does not have a site that has a portion in a steep slope, the coverage is allowed to be double, 25%. Um, um, this was, again, siting and distances. Our, our building, um, the modification that we're uh, asking for um, has a minimum of uh, 10 foot five between the buildings. These are the floor plans which haven't changed. We've reduced the, by the way, we reduced the program by reducing the size of the house to the minimum requirements that the family requires of us to provide for them. Um, this is the south facade showing um, the area 
of windows that provide for solar gain. We've reduced the massing of the stucco on this side by um, uh, designing and aligning another window. Um, we've reduced the size of the boundary crowning element. Um, and as you can see from the, uh, the rear facade of the house, we've changed the design and the color of the, of the staircase and the railings to unify them together. So that said, I believe that we've arrived at a harmonious design in terms of siting, uh, mass materials um, that I believe that can be approvable by the commissioners to fit in with the historic district, its character and its purpose. And I welcome any questions and um, any comments. And I'm happy to work with uh, the staff if there's any minor changes that would come up through this hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I think we do have some questions. So Commissioner Chapin, please go ahead. I, yes, could you just, uh, I, I understood you to say uh, you uh, reduced the height by about four feet. It looks like uh, the uh, building is now below the peak of the adjacent house. So could you uh, confirm that and just give an overall what's the height reduction in feet and also the uh, square footage reduction you have reduced both as I understand it. Um, yes, the, the original design um, was a three-story house made of reinforced concrete and it contained a lot of um, um, concrete beams that went across to create large clear, store, clear spaces within the dwelling. So and in addition to that, we also had a roof penthouse because the green roof was on top of the third floor. Now it's only on top of the second floor. So additionally to the overall height, we've removed that penthouse. We changed the structural system. So in reality, if you took the, the, the height of the building to the, the original design, which had the penthouse, that would have been another eight feet as well as the addition of um, the, the height floor to floor that we had for the concrete system. Um, so now the building, when I say it's, it's small, the, the, we're gonna have some bearing walls within the house, which allows us to shorten the span. So we're gonna have a, a thinner um, floor system. And we've also, with the owner's permission, we've reduced the floor to floor height, uh, in some cases from nine to eight feet, and in some cases um, from 10 feet down to nine feet. Um, so that scaled the house down and, it'll, and we, by also by setting it back a little bit on the site, it also goes down into the site another six to eight inches. So overall, this house in terms of its overall height is approximately the same height as the peak of the roof to, of, of the present owner's house to the south. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Bland. Commissioner Bland. So yeah, there, are, there we go. Uh, question is very simple. Is the stucco stucco or is it EFAS? No, it's a, it's a real concrete stucco system. We will need, we are required to put a continuous in, insulation board. Sure. And, and we're working with um, various suppliers. We'll probably have a cement board on the outside of the continuous insulation board and then have real cement. It will be elastometric stucco which just puts a little more plasticity in the material itself, but it's not an EFIT system. Thank you. That was what I was hoping you'd say. Okay, any other questions? All right, I don't see any other questions, so we may be ready to start our discussion. So commissioners, I'm sending requests for you all to unmute yourselves so we can begin our discussion. 
Um, and so the, the last time that we saw this as Michelle presented, um, I think that the commissioners present were comfortable with a contemporary approach um, to a new building. I think the commissioners first were comfortable with a new building on this particular site, um, the subdivided lot, and then also uh, comfortable with the contemporary approach um, at having previously asked for more information about how it nestled into its setting, related to the setting and related to the adjacent buildings. Um, and so the comments last time were largely about simplifying the materials and the uh, various elements and particularly the, and the colors, simplifying the colors, but also um, in particular, the um, element at the top and the commission asked for that to either be eliminated or set back. So um, there were various other suggestions, but that was sort of the common theme. So we'll go ahead and have our discussion and see how um, the proposed revisions today address your comments. Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you like to start this one? Sure, thank you. Um, so I think that the applicant has really um, worked, it seems, quite hard to address a lot of our concerns and um, both uh, about material, about scale, about um, the sort of uh, the size relative to the adjacent properties and the street. So I think there might be just a couple of things that still need to be resolved and I'm hoping that they'll be able to work with the um, staff, like for instance, the actual articulation of the control joints on the, on the facade, on the, on the stucco itself or whatever the material is gonna end up being. But I think for the most part, they've really done a good job and I'm, and I'm happy to find this appropriate. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Holford-Smith? Yes, I, I agree. I think that they worked really hard to um, make this, you know, modernist building fit much better into the context. Um, <clears throat> I agree with Adi that there are some things that still need, I think, some resolution, uh, working with staff. I think the details of that crown element, um, mm -hmm. if it is to be stucco, will we'll need to be detailed for weather tight um, issues and you know how it's going to resolve at the top, um, the joints you mentioned. Um, but I think otherwise um, I can find this appropriate. Thank you. Commissioner Chapin. Uh, yeah, I think they've uh, made a very good effort and have uh, you know reduced the height and brought it into better relationship with the adjacent structures. The, and the more natural materials I think are, are very suitable. Uh, and, and I agree with other commissioners, there's you know, a small amount to work with the crowning element on details, but I think uh, in general that uh, I appreciate the changes that they have made to uh, you know, try to make this fit in as, as much as possible in a, as a modern building within this context. Commissioner Devonshire. Um, yeah, I, I think that uh, this applicant has worked really hard to uh, to conform to the requests that we've made. You know, the control joints will be established by industry standards. Uh, right. They're not really a, a design feature. Um, I'm mildly concerned about the wash surface on that crown. Uh, he may want to work with staff to establish some sort of a, a flashing that might be minimally or not visible at all, perhaps a, a sheet metal that just has a, a short drip on e each uh, upper edge. But uh, otherwise, I think it's fine. It's really fine. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Chen. I agree with uh, all the commissioners and I also agree with Commissioner Devonshire that Crown, uh, if they can work with the staff uh, to modify a little bit. Okay, Commissioner Bland. Uh, this is a great story, I think, of how an architect listened uh, and worked with uh, a series of comments that were, I think, consistent, uh, generally consistent, uh, given by the various commissioners over now three hearings. Uh, I think we've arrived at a very good place. Um, I think the size of the house that I would call it the diminutive size of the house when seen from this angle, not necessarily from other angles, uh, is, uh, is, is a bit of a triumph actually and, and works to the advantage of putting a very 
uh, contemporary house among non-contemporary neighbors. Um, so I think that I think it works r really well. Uh, uh, ever hesitant to ever uh, come out with a, with something that's different from Commissioner Devonshire, but I think the location of those control joints are pivotal uh, to the design, and I would hope that uh, they're not just random wherever industry standard would say, but organized to highlight the very um, uh, rectilinear quality of the of the windows and sort of aligned vertically and horizontally with that with the window element. But overall, I think this is a very it come to be a very handsome, small design uh, in a in a revered um, residential neighborhood. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Lutfi. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was here for the first presentation and not for the second. So for me, there's been a, a very large move <laughs> from one to three. And I happen to agree with my fellow commissioners that uh, this project is in a very good place. It's um, so much more understated and recessive in terms of uh, the design and also its placement on the lot and its size. And I agree that it fits in very nicely and can coexist um, well with, with what surrounds it. And of course, I uh, agree with my, uh, with my fellow commissioners about working on the, uh, the, uh, the joints and uh, looking at the crown again. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Jefferson? Yeah, this is, this is much improved. The, the, the rigor of lowering the scale of the building, reducing the vertical scale and pushing it back, it made this, made this a success for me. It works very well. Okay. Commissioner Gustafson. Um, uh, while I appreciate the effort the applicant has put into uh, the project, and and it, and I do agree it's much improved, and they did listen to our comments, um, I, I remain alone in in my uh, in my opposition. Um, you know, I find there to be a fundamental inconsistency um, between this design and the definition of the district, um, and I and and there's a something of a sleight of hand involved in finding it acceptable by. Uh, comparison with the out of step structures in the district. So I'm not comfortable with it. Um, and, uh, um, and I understand that I stand alone in that regard. Okay, thank you. And I did I, uh, want to also note for the record um, that we did receive 20 letters in opposition from the neighbors, which of course have been um, shared with you all before today. So, um, but again, just noting that for the record. Okay, so I think that we have enough to move ahead with a vote contingent upon the applicant continuing to work with staff on the details, particularly um, at, to, at the control joints to the extent that we can um, <coughs> organize those and the uh, detailing at the and weather protection at the top of the crown element. So Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you make the motion? Yes. In the matter of LPC 21071953183 College Road, Fieldston Historic District, a house built after 1953, the application is to construct a new house on a portion of the tax lot that is to be subdivided. Uh, I note that the 318 College Road occupies a large lot with mature trees, which slopes steeply towards Tibbet Avenue that the adjacent lot is to be subdivided with a portion added to this lot and the proposed building will be sited at the end of the enlarged lot fronting College Road. I also note that the Fieldston Historic District is a largely intact example of a romantic planned suburb characterized by an eclectic variety of residential styles, including picturesque revival styles such as medieval English Tudor, Mediterranean, Dutch and Georgian colonial, that the prominent materials include clapboard, brick, stucco, field stone and slate, and that this district features a number of houses built after the 1950s, including significant modern buildings. I also note that the house plots historically varied in size from an acre to less than a quarter acre, and that the original designers cited the houses on their lots to take advantage of the varied topography of the area. Therefore, the size of setbacks inside yards vary. 
I finally note that in 1938, the New York City Planning Commission, CPC, created a special G zone for Fieldstone to restrict buildings to single family residences. And that in 1974, CPC established the Special Natural Area District, SNAD, to guide development to preserve significant natural features such as steep slopes, rock outcroppings and trees by requiring CPC review of site alterations and new developments. The historically, um, I, I recommend approval with just a few, they're not modifications, but just a couple of um, recommendations um, that his uh, finding that historically houses were built on lots of varying sizes with varying setbacks and side yards side, and, and side yard sizes. Therefore, the footprint of the new residential building relative to the size of the lot and side yards will be in keeping with lot coverage and placement of houses on lots found throughout the historic district. That the organization of the plan featuring a narrow main entrance facade and orientation of the main mass of the building perpendicular to the street will be in keeping with the orientation of other buildings in the district situated on narrow lots or on lots where the topography dictates the footprint of the building. Um, that there is precedent for garages with directly, which directly front the street on buildings from various periods within the historic district. Therefore, the presence of the garage on the main entrance facade will not call undue attention to itself. That the height of the massing closest to College Road will be in keeping with the height of the predominantly two and two and a half story suburban type houses, which characterize the district and the neighboring houses in the block. That the setback third floor will break up the building's masses in a way that relates with well with other contemporary buildings in the historic district and will minimize the, the appearance of the building's bulk when seen from the street. That the simple fenestration, streamlined detailing, blocky form, and slanted wall of the garage are features that are in keeping with 20th century modern houses of which there are other examples in the historic district. That the stucco clad crowning element in conjunction with dark brown finishes, railing and support, while currently unresolved could provide a contemporary termination to the street facing facade. And that the, material, that the material palette featuring cementitious stucco, wood and schist cladding and dark brown fenestration, sunshades and railing will be in keeping with materials and finishes typically found at primary facades of the building throughout the historic district. I found, find however, that the stucco clad crowning element creates an atypical, no, I don't. And, um, that, so a couple of things we I'd like to ask we'd like to ask for um, the applicant to work with staff to resolve and carefully um, think through the stucco control joints um, and to also consider the crowning element with respect to whatever uh, pro potential damage or deterioration weather can cause and to treat it appropriately. Excuse me, Commissioner Holford Smith, would you second that motion? I second it. All right, Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. And welcome Commissioner to our Bland. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. <laughs> Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Oh, he's recused, sorry. Okay. Commissioner Gustafson. Nay. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. With nine in favor and one opposed, the motion passes. That's approved. Please continue to work with the staff on the details. All right, and now we'll move to our public hearing agenda. Okay, we'll start with public hearing item number one, LPC 22-05580 an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, block 3024, lot one, 106 Stag Walk, the Williamsburg Houses Individual Landmark. This is an international style housing complex designed by William Lascaz and Richmond H. Shreve, built in 1935 to 38. And the application is to install barrier-free access ramps and alter the facades. Hey, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Brian, you now have control of the presentation. You can advance the slides using your arrow keys um, or your mouse. Please state your name for the record and you may begin. Uh, Brian Newman, Newman Design, Project Architect. Uh, good morning, Chair and Commissioners. Uh, thank you again. Um, as just stated, we're, we're here today, Williamsburg Houses, built in 1938. 
um, the architectural language, uh, European modernism, or an international style. The architects were William Lascaz and Richard Shreve. A uh, very historical, uh, important project is one of the first uh, affordable housing projects uh, in the United States. Um, if you recall, we were previously before uh, the board uh, for the custom windows where we um, replicated the steel frame. Let me just, there we go. Where we uh, replicated the original steel frame casements uh, to replace the current double hung windows, as well as the overall master plan and detailed landscaping plan with amenities for the overall site. Uh, which were both approved and uh, we thank you for that and actually construction has commenced uh, approximately three three months ago uh, and the first windows were recently installed and they are looking great so a uh, very exciting time on, on this project uh, just to remind you um, the uh, there are 20 buildings uh, they're all four stories and they are uh, spread across four super blocks the site itself is 23 acres, uh, 1,620 units. The reason why we're here today, um, historically, the federal government um, in walk-up or non-elevator buildings uh, has limited or accepted the scope of accessibility uh, conformance to within the units. Um, i.e. kitchens, bathrooms, door thresholds, things of that nature, door swings. Um, citing a term uh, known as technically infeasible when it comes to uh, items uh, as far as getting into the building if you had a walk up or you didn't have an elevator. Um, a few months ago, just prior to closing, uh, HUD has changed their position on all federally funded projects. Uh, all these projects, all the NYCHA projects that uh, come before you are now required to be 100% accessible from an accessible route. Essentially, an individual needs to be able to get into their unit directly from a sidewalk. Uh, an unobstructed, barrier-free uh, means into that individual apartment. Um, so we have for many months, um, probably close to 10 months, studied the uh, various different ways on, on how we could uh, cautiously and sensitively uh, achieve these goals um, and, and not obviously ruin the architecture that's here. Uh, there are a number of studies uh, regarding handicap lifts, uh, elevators uh, within the building, elevators at the stair halls, uh, elevators at different locations on the facade, large raised platforms with ramps going up to it. Um, this is all detailed and, and painstakingly gone through uh, and, and indicated in the appendix, and we can get into that later on uh, if, if need be. Um, essentially, what we did come up with, um, what, sorry, jump there, was, um, the least impactful way, carefully uh, designed, was to come up with exterior ramps uh, with direct access into individual apartments. Um, from there, we continue to refine that uh, over several months, that particular scheme, um, with the help of NPS, SHPO, have, have approved this current scheme that you see it. Um, Obviously, LPC staff uh, had, had a lot of input uh, and guidance and helping us further refine, uh, as well as most recently, uh, community board uh, had some good insight. Essentially, what we have done, um, we've internalized the majority of the ramps. Uh, we sort of tucked them in strategic places uh, to minimize visual impact, whether it's from the street or from being on the site. We've essentially kept all the um, pathways and circulation points that were so important to the project as well. Uh, if you recall, it's, as you can see on the, uh, the, uh, the slide here, uh, this project was not only just about the individual buildings, but it's also, there was a lot of important site uh, aspects to it, how the buildings are rotated uh, on these angles, uh, the meandering pathways and the courts and things of that nature. Um, we've 
reduced the number of ramps. We've reduced the size of the ramps. We've tried to maximize the number of apartments per ramp where appropriate. And uh, essentially, we've come up with a total of 26 ramps over the entire 23 acre parcel. Um, so within four blocks, there's a total of 26 ramps. This is block one, I'll, I'll go through each block in a moment. Um, it allows us to gain access to 49 units, full complete access. I, I'd like to point out that the 49 units that we're uh, entering here is 3% of the 1,620 units. Typically 5%, or 81 units in this case, uh, would have been required. But because this was literally a last minute um, change in policy just before the closing and the historical nature of the building and the cost implications of everything that, that you know, we're, we're presenting here, uh, HUD, NYCHA, development team uh, agreed to the 3% 49 on this particular project, this overall site. Um, the balance are being provided offsite in another NYCHA parcel. So I, I do want to put that in perspective of the overall scope. Typically, 81 would be required. We have 49 units, and over the entire 23 acres, there are only 26 ramps. Uh, so, so that being said, you see block one in front of you here. Uh, building one and two uh, had, had commenced. I commenced construction. Uh, so that kicked us into the first uh, uh, eligible buildings, uh, which are three and four. Um, essentially, you can see they're tucked in, and I have blow ups and I'll go over each one. They're essentially tucked in in areas that are within the courtyard. Uh, and we do have a few that are on the outside in these triangular pieces where we really mi minimize the visual impact and you gain uh, access to two, typically you're gaining access to two units. This is ramp one. You can see there are eight total here. I'm sorry, I meant block one. Block two is a very, uh, is an atypical block. There's only two buildings because it shares with the school uh, community center, uh, very limited access. Uh, so we do not have any ramps on block two. Block, sorry, jumped on me. Block three. There are eight total ramps as well. It's a very similar uh, approach on each one of the blocks, as you can see. Always internalizing. Block four has 11. I'll go to the, the blow ups. Just to clarify, we've grouped them in types. Technically, there are six different types of ramps, but I'd like to point out there's really four typical types. The last two is, is a one four bedroom and one five bedroom type ramp. Uh, as part of the requirement to meet the 504 standards, we're required to provide full accessibility to at least one unit of each unit type. There happen to be two atypical unit types on the project, a four and five bedroom unit. They're unique to the project. So we were required to present, uh, to provide ramps directly to those units as well. So typically, there are four typical types, and then there's these two one-offs. There'll be nine of the A A A3C3, five of the KK3, six of the N, and four of the R. I'll show you that now. So here's a blow up of the A3C3 ramp. This is what we like to call the breezeway ramp. Essentially, there are nine total locations. You can see on our key plan, this is the uh, overall four city blocks. The red is indicating the units we're getting into, the little darker uh, area is the actual ramp. Here's the blow up. Street side is on the left-hand side. Internalized ramp on the right-hand side. Something to note, very important here. This is the existing stair. We are not changing the width of the stair. As you can see on the top left, there's a uh, retaining wall. This is an open breezeway, which people can walk through. And there's just a, a low sort of 36 inch high uh, concrete wall. By removing that wall, we're able to get the ramp in. You can see the sort of existing condition on the right and the proposed. 
essentially we're tucking it in within that existing landscape area, removing from previous conversations, we're removing the, the nitrate imposed um, uh, steel uh, low, low fencing everywhere. The breezeway opening itself remains the same with the removal of the concrete wall. You can see the ramp sort of tucks into this corner and drops us off right into that breezeway. All the landscaping uh, that was previously uh, indicated and presented on the overall landscape and master plan is still going to be provided, which helps obviously soften the, uh, the visual impact uh, of the ramp itself. Uh, I'll go into the uh, railings in a little in uh, a little later in further detail, but the railings you see uh, obviously uh, will be fully compliant with the uh, accessibility and ADA requirements. Additionally, the guardrails themselves we have matched the historic um, uh, profiles uh, as far as the three uh, rectangular shapes uh, and materials. But I'll go into that la later on. This is KK, there are five locations. You can see here, it's essentially a ramp to a platform that gains access to two apartments. Uh, the key here, uh, when possible, we try to maximize the number of units that we can gain access to without having the platform uh, be completely overbearing. We, we did a previous study where we tried to really reduce the number of ramps, except the platform started meandering it, it, it all around and they were just getting very imposing. So by tucking it in here against what I'll call the end wall of, of the unit, uh, you can see we can still keep the original pathways here. We can tuck it tight. We gain access into the two individual units. Towards the end of the presentation, I'll go over very specifically what we're doing with the, the windows and the doors and the entry points, um, but essentially uh, entering into the existing masonry openings into the units on the KK type. And you can see this is the photo of the existing conditions. Uh, here's the rendering, essentially keeping this archway, just make a little opening here. We can get our uh, ramp into there and gain access into the two openings. Again, the landscaping, we're working directly with the landscape architects every step of the way to make sure we're being able to maintain and minimize uh, the impact of the ramp itself. Uh, one thing to note, the exposed concrete will be treated the same exact material at the same time as the material we've previously approved for the foundation treatments of the exposed concrete um, from the re restorative uh, project. This is the end ramp. This is what I call the, uh, uh, the triangular piece, as I was mentioning before, on the street side. Um, again, we, we tuck it in here parallel to the building within this triangular piece that is on the street. It does gain us access to two units at the same time with a very minimal platform. Um, there are six locations in total across the total site. You can see the existing sort of uh, photo with this, as again, I say the, the triangular shape running it parallel to the, to the facade, a little opening right here. Uh, enabling the landscaping on either side, switchback railing, very small platform, gains access to two individual units. R, R type, four locations in total. Again, you can see in the top with the red uh, are the total locations, internalized away from the street, hugs the corner of the building. Um, that, one thing we should note, uh, the, the, the Difference in grade to first floor is approximately 42 inches. So it's a significant change to, to get up there. Uh, and that's typical throughout. It does vary slightly, but generally speaking, we're trying to make up approximately 42 inches. Uh, again, we're keeping the, uh, the overall curvature uh, and pathways, a slight little opening in here. The ramp wraps tight, small platform, gain access to two apartments. You can see the existing photo and the rendering. Right, come right off the main main pathway uh, over by the entrance, hugs the building, and gains access into these two apartments. This is the five bedroom. It's a one off type unit. It's very similar, a switchback unit. What's uh, unusual about this one? This void or space between the building and the ramp. This is actually. Um, 
uh, an access way and ramp down to the cellar for maintenance purposes. So there's a void here and continuously goes down. So we have a, a switchback ramp with a little bit of an archway to get you into this, uh, in, into this apartment. It's a one-off five bedroom apartment that's required uh, for accessibility. Uh, we thought this was the least conspicuous location as it's tucked in. Uh, if we tried to gain access from the other side of the unit, the ramp was very large, starts impeding on the pathways uh, as well as the entryways uh, down below. You can see the existing photo here. This rail is for that uh, guard rail to that ramp down below. So we make a small little sidewalk coming off the main path. We switch back and we go directly into the apartment. Lastly, this is the four bedroom and atypical, just one of them located on block number one. Um, you can see we've, it's a, a switch back a little bit more back and forth than typical, but we, we did that purposely to get it aligned to tuck tight into this corner of the building. Um, essentially tucking it within these two facades, we're able to replicate this uh, arch um, to a certain degree without uh, changing the overall pathways to the building. Again, this is a required unit that we need to get into. If we placed it on the other side, uh, this is over by building entries by the stair hall. Uh, and then this does have a similar situation where you get the drop with access into the cellar. Uh, so we thought this was the least conspicuous location. And you can see the rendering here uh, tucked into this corner. You can see we're replicating that archway. Um, to mimic and keep that original pathway uh, intact. Regarding um, how do we actually get into the, to the units from the exterior, this was the previous uh, approved uh, window system, the uh, replica of the steel frame, if you recall. Um, we are maintaining every, every single location uh, that we're gaining direct access to these units. We are maintaining the masonry openings. We are essentially taking out a window and putting in an operable door. Uh, the door is manufactured and designed, detailed, finished, painted, and, and installed by the same exact team that has designed uh, the previously approved windows. So therefore, all all mullion sections, all extrusions, everything is going to be exactly the same as previously approved, manufactured at the same time. Uh, so we don't have any dimensional discrepancies, uh, color discrepancies and so forth. So here there, there's a window type A that was modified. Uh, a, sorry, jumped. A B has to be modified. A C has to be modified. This is depending on which one. This is the, the C on the mirrored side. D. Just to give you context, how it would look in the overall section of the facade, you can see we, we absolutely maintain masonry openings. We're not changing those. We kept the, the muttons and divided lights matching visually. So from a distance, hopefully one's eye just looks at the, the muttons and, and divided lights uh, and and it, it will essentially be lost that it's an actual door that's going a little bit lower uh, down to, to the lower level. And you can see each window type there. Uh, this is just, generally speaking, some of the clearances were required uh, uh, to, to put in 30 foot max run. Then we need a five foot platform. Uh, as I said before, many of these are approximately 42 inches high. So you do need that additional uh, ramp, that additional return. We need the five foot clearances uh, in front of the doors. So that's how we get some of these platforms. You can see we've really tried to minimize the impact of this and really with fine tooth comb, try to keep on compressing and, and really carefully select where these were being placed. Uh, this is just the graphic talking about the same material being placed on the exposed concrete. Here's the other version. I don't want to bore everyone with all these. I do want to get to the detail of the railing. Historic railing 1938 from the uh, from the drawings, you can see and still existing today, there are essentially three horizontal rails that 
in my mind, speak to the architectural language of exactly what you know the, the intent was then. These horizontal rails are stainless steel and minimal you know, vertical, um, vertical posts. They are a rectangular uh, cross section. So what we did for the guardrail, the outside, if you will, we've mimicked those three, uh, those three rails in that cross section, replicating the, the rectangle, uh, rectangular shape, the dimension, as well as you can see this, uh, the arch at the end is a parallel, uh, essentially an extension or parallel to the uh, top and intermediate rail. In contrast, the ADA requires, which you can see beyond, that the uh, that that loop, if you will, that extension be parallel to the ground. Uh, we thought it would be important to mimic the overall uh, original architecture on the uh, on the bound on the bottom side here to, to replicate what was originally there. Uh, that's why you see the difference. Sorry, it seems to be not switching. Oh, there it goes. So you can see the cross section here. The three prominent members I was mentioning before, there will be stainless steel, they're that rectangular shape. Now per code on the guardrail, uh, we are required for four inches on center intermediate members uh, to protect children. Originally, uh, we had these as steel rods uh, in, in conversations and working with community board one, uh, they thought it was a little bit heavy and uh, suggested that we use stainless steel cable system. So it could maybe uh, visually disappear from a distance. We think that was a good idea. Uh, and we have uh, implemented that uh, in this presentation. Uh, and then internally, this is the required handrail uh, from ADA uh, compliance uh, that you can see. And that was what I was uh, showing beyond before. Uh, that concludes the overall presentation. I just like again to reiterate that there are a total of 26 ramps across 23 acres, four super blocks. Uh, this gains us access to 49 apartments. And typically, if if HUD did not work with us and, and Nigel on this, it would have been 81 units required. Uh, on this uh, particular uh, project. Um, we really do think we've uh, fine tuned this and really worked through and try to really minimize the visual impact uh, of these particular uh, presented ramps. Okay, thank you. thank you. And thank you for a very clear and thorough presentation. And I know you've worked very, very hard on this and analyzing um, options and some of that is represented in the appendix to this presentation and but I don't think we'll, we need to um, go there unless we have a question that relates to it. So we do have a number of questions and we'll start with Commissioner Shamir Barron. Thank you. Thanks for a, a great presentation. This is a very uh, important, I think, and exciting project. But I have a question about the kind of the first premise, which I wonder if you can just help me through here. What was the reason that you didn't um, try to treat the, in a sense, the, the kind of the party, the, the logic of the, of the project, which says that there are no exterior entrances to units, but rather you access units through a, through a, a, a shared stair or entry, as far as I understand. So why didn't you, or did you attempt to work on that shared entry element and see if there would be po it would be possible to um, attach, replace um, something, extend that entry stair or entry way so that you could access a number of different units or even just one of the units, but in but internally um, using a, a ramp attachment to attachment or or again replacement of the of the shared stair element excellent question that's exactly where we started we spent probably two plus months studying that this particular project is or these buildings are very unique um, if you recall call there are multiple stair halls per building essentially those stair halls are uh, vertical transportation 
And in each floor, the apartments open directly onto the stair hall. Two, three, sometimes four stairs directly on the stair hall itself or the landing, if you will, at the floor level. We don't have a common corridor. It, it's essentially apartments opening directly into a stair. Now, therefore, you can't simply just gain access to a stair hall or a corridor and then distribute across. So that's one limiting factor. More importantly, the way that stair is designed, you first come up, let's just say on average, two steps at, at, at the stoop, we'll call it. You come into a three, approximately three foot wide landing, then you have to go up another seven risers. What happens is you've now walked in underneath the landing side. So the low part of the stair is on the exterior side. In order to, even if I gained access or put a lift or something along that, or even a ramp to get to the first floor to make up that seven risers, I'd have to get all the way into the opposite side of the stair. I can't do that because the low side of the stair or the landing side of the stair <laughs> is on the outside or the window side. Therefore, the entire stair structure and facade with the blue porcelain glazed tile and the vented windows, that all would have to be completely reconstructed because there's not enough headroom to get underneath and into the building, whether it was a ramp, whether it was a lift. And then we continued further and said, let's look at something adjacent to it. But if I put a ramp and got into an apartment adjacent to it, I don't have access to anything but that one apartment. We said, okay, can we put an elevator in? Right, that's the question. Yep. Can you replace the stair with an elevator? I, it's my only means of egress. So I can't take the stair out. That's literally for those units, it's the only means of egress. So I'd have to put an elevator in. So then we looked at various studies. How do we get an elevator in? We can't reduce the number of units or bedrooms because if they're occupied units, it'd be a reduction of services that's not allowed. So we'd have to put an exterior elevator. In order to do that, we looked at maybe putting an elevator in front of the stairs. We had the landing issue. We looked at it adjacent to it because Again, going back to that central stair core without a common corridor, we have to lose a unit every single time on every floor, which we can't because someone's losing their apartment then. And obviously we'd have this large structure, whatever we did, whether it was something as, as, as totally separate as a glass cube or something that was more in kind to the architecture. The, the bottom line is we would have this large, let's call it 10 by 15 because you'd need the elevator and the, the platform to come in or out before the elevator, sort of appendage stuck to this. Plus we're reducing all the number, of, we're reducing a unit every single floor that we, we got in. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Goldblum. Sorry about that. Um, so just uh, remind me, you're going for the railings in stainless, or at least the feature railings, let's call it, and feature elements of the railing in stainless, and the rest is black, right? No, we, we at current proposition is to do everything in stainless. And is that, is it your understanding that that was the, the railing that the Scots proposed that you showed was in stainless? We, we believe it was. Uh, uh, LPC staff members uh, were on the site with us as well recently, and they believe it was stainless as well. Interesting. And um, the uh, cables are usually really, really good looking up for about a half an hour, and then they start to sag. And uh, so is there a maintenance com commitment to uh, maintaining uh, these lovely but fragile things? Yeah, we can certainly... Uh, make sure that's put in place. Um, there's a large staff uh, management is ownership also on, on this particular project with uh, the housing authority as well. We're all partnered. Uh, so I, I can I, I can say that a maintenance plan would certainly be be in place to, to keep them. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Holford Smith. 
Yeah, I had a similar question about the handrail material. Um, on slide 34, the original drawing calls it out as aluminum. Um, and then on the version of the presentation that we have, it also calls for the new to be aluminum. But I, you, in your current presentation, you're saying that you're proposing all of the elements to be stainless steel. It, that is correct. Uh, we did see that on the drawing, but per our walkthrough end of last week, I forget exactly what day it was. It might've been Friday morning. Um, LPC staff members uh, believe the original was installed as stainless. Um, we did just update it, uh, the presentation, but I think it was finished at about 7.30 this morning. I don't think it got uploaded in time. Um, but yes, you're, you're correct. We saw the note. That's why we put it as aluminum, but we, we believe it was stainless. Um, but we're, we're open to what the commissioners say, but we, we think that's the original intent. And the finish, can you go back to that slide? Because um, in the presentation that we have, you have both polished and brushed. I'm just right. curious so, as to what you're So we, now. we think they're both polished now. We think polished. everything should be polished stainless. We believe that's what it was. And the, the paint color in the presentation is what, what is that for? The windows? That's been removed since then, but yes, it was for the windows. Exactly. <laughs> um, just reiterating, it's the same color as the windows. Okay, thanks. Okay, Commissioner Jefferson. Uh, two part question. Are the ramps located in the landscape portion of the site? And two, if the if the ramps are encroaching on the landscape, are you are you willing to open up the landscape to open up so around the ramps so that the ramps are encased in landscape? But that's absolutely in the intention. And I think this uh, slide, that either that one or um, the typical one, uh, this they are within the landscape aisles or, or landscape uh, areas. Uh, and we've been worked very closely with DirtWorks, the landscape architect who previously presented that master plan and detailed master plan to maintain those plantings. And, and put those plantings in those, uh, those same areas and to just slightly modify so we can make sure that we are um, basically minimizing the exposed vertical wall of that concrete, uh, which you can see here. So the answer to your question is yes, they're in the landscape areas. Yes, they're encased in landscape. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? All right, I think we don't have any other questions at the time, at this time. So we'll move to public testimony. If you're in the meeting and would like to testify on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And we will start with anyone who signed up in advance as always, but whether you signed up or not, be sure to raise your virtual hand so we can find you in the, in the group of attendees. And I'll turn it over to Sasha Seely to take us through the testimony. Alrighty, thank you. Helen Freeman from Historic District Council. You should receive a request from me. All right, Helen, I see you have accepted my request. Please just unmute your mic and state your name for the record. You have three minutes. Hello, my name is Helen Freeman from Historic Districts Council. The Historic Districts Council appreciates the difficulty of incorporating these ramps into the existing buildings. In light of that, we believe the applicant should study ways of making these structures more sympathetic to the existing environment. Perhaps greater articulation of the concrete base in a way that visually breaks it up into vertical and horizontal components would help. The handrail should be painted black steel and the vertical emphasis achieved by the use of spindles rather than the current horizontal rails. The landscape fencing already present on the site provides a fine precedent for de detailing these guards. We hope that the applicant can work with staff to find a more diminutive and quiet solution. Thank you. Great, thank you. John Graham from Victoria Society of New York, you should be receiving a request for me now. All right, John, I see you have accepted my request. Please just unmute your mic and state your name for the record. You have three minutes to speak. Good morning, Commissioners. John Graham for the Victorian Society in New York. 
Founded in New York City in 1966, the Victorian Society in America is dedicated to fostering the appreciation and preservation of our 19th and early 20th century heritage. The New York chapter promotes preservation of our historic districts, individual landmarks, interiors, and civic art. <clears throat> the Victorian Society in New York is testifying in this application because of the importance of this post-Victorian housing development and as a follow-up to our testimony of last year on the proposed major renovation of the grounds and window replacement. There is no question that installation of 27 exterior ramps will be a major intervention and not a happy thing to contemplate, but we're not aware of any better alternate for providing at least some accessibility to these apartments. We're pleased that the design and materials of the ramps and railings take their cues from the existing buildings to help them fit in. We have two suggestions. First, unless it's already known that there is demand for all the accessible units proposed, perhaps the installation can be done in phases so that ramps are not built if they're not needed. Second, sections of the ramps, generally at least the first, the entire first leg of a switchback ramp are less than 30 inches off the ground. And on these sections, 42 inch high barrier railings with intermediate pickets or cables are not required. We recommend that on these lower segments, only required handrails be provided. This will significantly reduce the visual bulk, bulk of the ramps and density of the railings. Thank you very much, commissioners. All right, thank you. Those are my signups. Let me just take a glance over and see if I see any additional hands raised. Okay, and I do not see any more hands raised, so I will just note for the record that Brooklyn Community Board 1 recommends that the applicant reduce the number of vertical posts, consider a cable rail system, and paint the railings the same color as the windows. I will pass it back over to you, Chair Carroll. Great. Thank you, Sasha. And now I'd like to turn back to Mr. Newman and ask if you'd like to respond to some of the comments we've heard or any of the comments we've heard. Just, yeah, if you can unmute yeah. yourself, yeah. Um, regarding um, one of the comments, uh, as far as further articulation on the foundation wall and the um, utilizing the vertical posts that are currently there as precedents, uh, I, I just want to uh, respond that essentially the idea behind the, the concrete uh, foundation walls that we'll be pouring is to minimize the visual impact with that landscape planting that I was uh, discussing before and indicating uh, there. Uh, we did look at maybe some articulation, but it does not align with the, the slab edge or detailing that's on the existing building. So uh, I was afraid it would look off for a mistake if, if it didn't uh, align. So just further enhancing the landscape and we'll soften that. And regarding the pickets, uh, the pickets, uh, those existing fences that NYCHA had put in, those are actually coming out um, as part of the previously approved uh, master plan uh, and overall site improvements. Uh, all that low fencing is going to be removed. Uh, so therefore the uh, precedents uh, would not be on site anymore. Um, regarding the railing guardrail, um, as far as colors, uh, we're, I think I just mentioned that before. Yes, uh, CB1 did mention at one point uh, to paint the rails black possibly or match the windows um, as well as the stainless steel cables. We 100% uh, agree uh, with that state stainless steel uh, cable intervention. We thought that was a great idea. Um, we went back and forth with the railings. Ultimately, I thought it might be best to match the finish of the existing rails at the breezeways. That's why we, we chose the stainless steel, but we're certainly open to uh, the commissioner and chair's opinion on that and direction. And, and lastly, just regarding the extension of the, uh, the guardrail when it's less than 30, uh, the handrail would still be required um, and I, I think the introduction of the architecturally significant guardrail in front of it um, takes your eye away from the round, uh, the round handrail with the other, uh, you know, different profile. Uh, and I thought by putting the the guardrail in with the three rectangular cross sections, 
visually when once so one's walking quickly by or even from a distance that's what your eye will go to and it'll help just relate to the entire project otherwise i'm afraid it looks like it's sort of half baked we didn't quite finish it maybe we try to value engineer something um so so that's that's just the reasoning of thought process behind that okay great thank you and commissioners do we have any final questions All right, I'm not seeing any final questions. So I'm sending requests to all of you to unmute so that we can move to close the hearing and begin our discussion. All right, and Commissioner Gustafson, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you, and Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the hearing is closed and we'll now begin our discussion. Um, and I wanna thank the applicant for a, a very thorough um, and well thought out presentation. I think it helped answer a lot of questions and, um, and also thank you for all of the effort you put into analyzing different alternatives, which we didn't spend as much time on today. Um, so let's begin our discussion. Commissioner Holford Smith, would you start this one? Sure. Um, well, I certainly appreciate the uh, challenge that this posed to the applicant um, trying to fit in accessibility to buildings that were designed uh, to not have any, any any kind of accessibility at all. Um, and I appreciate all the alternatives that they looked into, but I, um, you know, having heard their description of each location, they, they seem appropriate to me. Um, I think it, they, what they're trying to do is maximize the number of units that are accessed with the least amount of ramp. Um, and I understand that they're also not even achieving the required uh, amount that they need on this site. They'll have to go to another site to achieve the rest of their, of their well, required amount of uh, accessible units. Um, so in general, I find it um, appropriate um, my only concern, or my biggest concern, I should say, is the, the finish and the design of the handrail. Um, I, I think that trying to match the original profile is appropriate. Um, I'm just concerned that polished stainless steel, it, you know, I'd be, like to get further um, confirmation on that as the original finish. So it doesn't seem to me that that would have been the original finish um, for, this type of, um, for this type of building. Um, but I think otherwise, work, maybe working with staff, they could uh, um, perhaps either uh, maybe a brushed stainless steel or aluminum, uh, sort of a natural aluminum. Um, but I think that the use of the cable rail uh, intermediates is a good one. Help, hopefully that will disappear. Um, and hopefully they will have a good maintenance program, not only mm -hmm. to keep the, the cables in line, but also to maintain the plantings that are gonna be important <laughs> to screen all of this. Um, but I think, I think the, um, adjustments to the windows are appropriate as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Commissioner Chapin. Uh, yes, uh, I agree with, uh, Commissioner, uh, Holford Smith's comments in general, and, uh, also, uh, uh, approve the changes, to the window, uh, proposal, uh, with regard to the finish, I think, yeah, it's, it's something that might be a little less obvious and might be uh, appropriate. I, I do not think a dark color would be uh, appropriate because I think that would tend to make the, uh, it look like a design feature uh, be, if it were the same color as the windows or something. So I think the lighter color is better. And, I, I think that the suggestion she just made, and particularly obviously finding out what might have been uh, the, an original uh, design uh, fabric or and, and finish uh, of the uh, fencing, this type of any type of fencing similar to this would be would be appropriate. And I think the cable rail is, is a good idea. So that I can approve this in general uh, okay. with some, maybe a little bit more research with the staff on a couple of items. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Goldblum. Thank you. Um, 
Uh, I agree with what has been said so far, uh, basically. Um, I think that the, uh, the, the bright stainless is, a, is, is certainly unusual, not unexpected, but if the history backs it up, I would go along with it. But um, it, it certainly is uh, striking. Um, uh, you know, if, if, the, if the staff is convinced that it is the original <laughs> intent of the design, then I, I, would, I would accept it. But I, I think if not, a, a paint would be a better so solution or the brushed. Um, I think that the uh, cable rails are a mistake. I think they'll look good for a couple of that, couple of hours. And then first time somebody, I mean, you have to realize these are big apartments. And even if there's a person in there who's handicapped, the other people in the apartment probably aren't. And they're going to go nuts, you know, going up these long zigzaggy ramps. I, 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 and I think they'll, they'll, you know, especially kids, I think they're going to climb over it and you'll, you'll wind up having people messing up those very nice cable railings. It'll be impossible to maintain. Um, I also think for the, from that same rationale uh, that they might explore uh, adding stairs to these stoops in some manner so that you could either take the ramp or the stair. Uh, I think that the setting, setting them in landscaped areas is very, uh, very, very uh, good. Um, and if there are areas where they aren't kind of ensconced in, in landscaping that they could explore again with staff uh, trying to uh, extend the landscaped areas into the walkways slightly so that they could be uh, nestled in landscape. Okay, and just in, in, because they have to have the four inches on center within that space, are you suggesting then a heavier rail would be better than a cable rail? Given, you know, given the longevity of this complex and the intense usage morning, it will have, I, I, would, I would say, as well as uh, you know, a steel, a a stainless steel rod which is really or about bar switching the way uh, that be, goods be more sturdy. And I think the design is quite attractive, but um, I just worry that those cable rails aren't going to last. Commissioner Devonshire. I, I pretty much agree with all the comments that have been made about the, the, the finish. And um, I really agree with Michael about the cable rail. If, if I was a five or six year old, as my wife accuses me constantly, I would be jumping up and down on those cables as if they are a playground, uh, a piece of playground equipment. And so they're not going to last long at all. I think that part of it needs to be rethought. But I, I think everything else is uh, appropriate, given given the uh, comments that we've made. Okay. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I do think that we have approved cable wire as a really transparent good solution on other ramp rails where there's a primary reading that kind of matches a historic area rail. Or, and then a sort of tra more transparent uh, cable wire solution to fill in the the void or the you know to allow for that 18 inches or to provide for that I mean that provide for the four inches. So it is something we have done before. So if if you're not comfortable here, it would be helpful to articulate why not here versus another site. Um, and I you know the applicant I know started out with steel rods and and working through the community board, um, revised it to be the cable mesh, so the cable wire. So let, if, if we have continued concerns about that, let's try to articulate why in this particular site, besides the maintenance issue, the design may not be appropriate. Okay, Commissioner Chen. Yeah, I pretty much agree, concur with you, most of the comment, uh, although, I must say, I have uh, number one. I want to commend the applicant for uh, figuring out a systematic uh, pro uh, a set of uh, prototypes uh, to address this serious issue. Uh, and uh, and but on the personal level, I have less of a concern with the somehow I have less concern with the stainless steel material. I do not know why. I may be in the minority. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Bland. Um. Yeah, I don't need to repeat much of what's been said because I'm in agreement. Uh, and I, I, would, I would not have thought 
to raise the issue of the cable. But now I am also in the camp of uh, worrying about that long term, partly for the maintenance reasons that have been expressed. Um, but also cable is a design statement as well, I think still. Uh, yes, it sort of disappears, but it's also when you see it, it's a design statement. It's like cool and hip as opposed to just normal. And in this way, it's a little bit like glass used occasionally to disappear. And in my judgment, it doesn't disappear. For instance, on railings, on <coughs> visible rooftop additions, it doesn't really disappear. It calls attention to itself, I think, because it's unusual. It's a design statement. So um, if, if I am in opposition to it, and I'm not sure I am, it would be for design issue that I've just uh, enunciated as well as the, the maintenance, the long-term maintenance issues. But also it seems as if this issue has been well tread upon and thought through by lots of different people uh, and at the community board level, et cetera. Uh, so I'm a little loath to sort of um, say, let's change it right away, but I'll, put myself in the, in the camp of being uh, concerned about it, at least. Um, and the color, of course, I, I thought also black might have been the appropriate color, but I'm persuaded I was completely wrong on that approach. Black would not be appropriate. It would, uh, uh, it would signify that it's part of the original idea of, of this. And I think the idea of, of this as being an added layer is, is the right thing. And I think the black paint would be not very long lasting. So I think some sort of metal, whether it's stainless or brush stainless or some other kind of metal aluminum um, is the appropriate approach. Thank you, Commissioner Lutfi. Um, I, uh, I have to say every time this applicant has been before us, I've been very impressed with the incredible uh, thoughtfulness and analysis that they do when they are looking at the, the site and the project before them and the architecture and the, the, uh, the way that the entire campus is navigated and, you know, they've all done all of those things again. So I want to thank them as they've been thanked by others. I, I happen to think that the solution is really, really well done on so many levels. I mean, it's thoughtful, it's smart, it's uh, integrated into uh, the campus in a way that it is, as the applicant said, you know, tucked in wherever possible and it doesn't compete with the architecture. And that is one reason that I, in particular, really like the, the lighter um, color and uh, of, the, um, of the ramp, because given, given that and given, and also combining it with the landscape, uh, which is, uh, you know, designed to you know, enhance, distract, cover, et cetera. I, th I think that it's, uh, I mean, couldn't be much better. <laughs> I think Commissioner Goldblum mentioned something. I'm, I'm gonna defer on the cable. I, I, whatever everyone thinks about that, I'm fine with. But I think Commissioner Goldblum said something very important that I don't wanna leave at the doorstep, no pun intended. And that is that, maybe there should be a, a little um, just straight up entryway in addition to this, because for people who want quick access, why should you have to walk the whole distance of this ramp if you could just walk up, um, walk up quickly walk up these steps. And I think people of all ages uh, for whom this is not difficult, uh, you know, difficult, would uh, probably be happy about that. Um, I, I wanna see if there's anything else. No, I, I think that's, I think that's it. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Jefferson. Now, I see this project 
<clears throat> excuse me, as a, a ramp in a garden. You're walking through a garden on a ramp and you're coming into the building. And I see the gardener's dominant, the planting, the scale of it. In this picture right now on the left-hand side, the ramp is dominant, the planting is subordinate. If the planting was higher and, and, and the idea of, of, of a planting of different scale and the ramp being subordinate to the planting and this notion of walking through a garden to get to your house, that's a concept that should be reinforced. Even if indeed they have to expand the uh, landscaping portion to get that feeling, that would be part of this, make this whole project more exciting. And indeed, it's better to walk through a garden than walk up a step, you know, so it, it, it would be a pleasure to walk through the planting to get to your apartment. That's my comments. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Gustafson. Yeah, um, this is a massively complicated um, situation. And, uh, and I think the applicant did an amazing job dealing with it. When you think about some of the simpler situations that we see um, um, accessibility applications in the context of, um, and uh, people struggle with them. And this is just, you know, in, in terms both of quantity and, um, and the nature of the design of the, um, the interiors of these floors, a very complicated situation. And I very much appreciate not merely the, uh, um, the, the design result, um, uh, uh, but also the, uh, the the presentation of of um, um, of a, um, a very complicated um, set of ramps. Um, I think the applicant uh, himself um, summarized my feeling about it, which is that um, essentially it will be lost, is what he said. And I think that is true of the design as it stands. I understand some of the suggestions made by my fellow commissioners, and I'm okay with those. Um, I particularly agree with Commissioner Jefferson on the concept that um, in certain of these situations, we 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 would want to uh, we would recommend that they increase the um, the planting beds so that there is more of a shield um, around them. But otherwise, um, I, I'm fine with it just the way it is. And I also want to point out that I think that I happen to have a little bit more faith than uh, Commissioner Devonshire. I think most children are at least as well behaved as he is, um, and uh, so I don't think that's going to be a problem. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Thanks. Um, I'm afraid that I'm having, finding this more challenging than others. Uh, but, and of course, uh, I appreciate the incredible complexity here and all of the things that you can't do uh, and that you need to accommodate. And I also appreciate the analysis that's been done, although I feel like I haven't spent, been able to spend time with that analysis to, to really understand um, a, sort of other possibilities, even though I've looked through your appendix. Um, so, uh, and I think that my difficulty with this is that um, while it solves the issue of um, sort of supplying or achieving some accessible units, it does not get at what I think is the spirit of the project, which came, was related to and associated with um, the kind of the spirit of so many of the um, housing residential complexes that preceded it in Europe and here in the modernist era. And that has to do with a, um, an approach to universality. Now this is not, what, this is not universal design because universal design is another matter, but universality, collectivity, the idea of accessing um, and, and, and um, and, and being sort of having an equal share in, in the thing. There, I think would never have been a case where, where um, and I don't wanna be presumptuous, maybe Liskaz would have figured out another way, but I imagine that if this project were given to Liskaz to figure out the first thing sort of in that time, maybe not in this time, um, would have been to solve for um, accessibility of wheelchairs to every unit or a way to kind of to figure out um, f that the kind of the, the, the main, the doorway would have to be kind of enlarged or that whole element that is the access to the entire building would have to be dramatically reconstructed, re reimagined in order to, to achieve that. So I, I, I'm not saying that, that the applicant is not 
made those efforts, but I don't, I haven't been walked through them. I don't understand them. And I don't know if that was the dominant, if kind of the primary objective was to make sure that the spirit of this kind of universality was the number one. And I think that it's, it, it absolutely trumped or like is, is more important than what we're saying is the sort of the aesthetic of the project. Uh, and I think that that's a miss here. And, um, and I, I don't really know what to do about it because again, I, I, I do believe that they've done, given the parameters that they laid out, um, in a sense, they answered those questions and addressed them in, in the best way that they could. But I'm, I'm not um, comfortable with the fundamental premise. So would that have meant like an entire building would be a universal building or an accessible building? Well, that might not be uh, acceptable in other terms. Um, would that have meant losing a unit and having to kind of really change one of the buildings or several of the buildings in order to add to it? Would that have been acceptable to us, to anybody? Would that have been economically feasible? I, I just don't know all of the variations, uh, but I don't think that the spirit of this modernist project has, is, 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 is helped. In fact, is, there is tremendous detraction here by having one unit accessible through the exterior of the building and only that unit. Okay, and I, you know, I do appreciate your thoughtfulness about this and sort of understanding original intent and universality. And I mean, you know, one thing I would say is just um, from a practical perspective, there is the question before us is this particular application and is this right. particular application appropriate? Um, maybe not the most not the question, the question isn't the most, whether it's the most appropriate of any possible solution that could have been presented to us. So we're looking at this um, as it's presented today. Um, right, also, but the question is, I'm sorry, uh, Chair, uh, Carol, what is, what does it mean to preserve and, and to um, protect these particular buildings? Like what, what are we, what, what are, I don't even, I'm not even sure that we've established what the terms for appropriate, of appropriateness are here so that we can, you know, I mean, are they stainless versus black paint or um, a buff colored brick versus another brick? I mean, what really are the terms? I think that it is really, a, it gets to an aesthetic decision. I think that, um, you know, approach is certainly something that we would want to consider, but as we're presented with a particular approach, we are looking at whether the size, scale, materials, details, density um, have a negative impact on the complex of buildings and the siting and their architecture. Right, so, it, so accessing just one unit from the exterior rather than accessing all the units from a more robust um, circulation system. I mean, one could say that that has a negative impact, correct? I mean, I could say that. You could say that, I'm certainly. Saying, yes, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, and I do wanna note that um, in terms of the, the comments about adding stairs, um, we've been told that they are maintaining the existing internal stairs. And so all people can still enter their apartments through their existing steps. That's so, um, okay. So I think we've heard a lot of comments and um, I think what I'd like to do is move toward a motion um, to approve um, with the contingency or the, the requirement that they continue to work with the staff to um, confirm the historic finish and and if if it cannot be confirmed that it was polished that they do a brushed finish um, that they continue to explore with staff um, the, the poss opportunities for um, landscaping and possible possible alternatives um, that achieve code requirements transparency and durability. Um, of the railings. So why don't I go ahead and um, make that motion and then we'll see where we are. Okay, in the, oops, sorry. 
Okay, in the matter of docket number 22-05580-106 Stag Walk, the Williamsburg Houses Individual Landmark, an international style housing complex designed by William Muscaz and Richmond H. Shreve and built in 1935 to 38. This is an application to install barrier free access ramps and alter the facades. And um, I recommend approval uh, with some requirements and that the approval finding that the proposed ramps will provide barrier free access into the buildings without substantially altering or obscuring significant features of this individual landmark that the majority of the ramps are limited in footprint with minimal landings and switchbacks and will have a uh, discrete presence within the overall monumental scale of the housing complex and select streetscapes, that the proposed ramps will be partially screened by plantings and landscape features, and the majority of the ramps will not be visible within the context of the primary street facing facades, that the proposed design and materials of the ramps, including concrete paving and a stainless steel uh, railings will harmonize with the materials and color palette of, the, of international style buildings, that the design and profiles of the proposed railings will recall the design of the historic handrails found throughout the complex, that enlarging select windows into and converting them into door openings will occur at non-historic commission approved window assemblies and will require the removal of only a limited amount of masonry and that the proposed work will not detract from the special architectural and historic character of this individual landmark. However, I recommend that the um, applicant uh, continue to work in consultation with the staff to confirm the original finish of the original railings. And if it is not, if it can't be confirmed that it had a polished finish, that the applicant revise the finish to be a brushed finish or painted finish, and that the applicant can continue in consultation with the staff to explore poss possible alternatives that achieve code requirements, transparency, and durability of the railings, um, particularly the, the cable portions of the railings, and um, the opportunities for expanding the landscaping. All right, Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. Thank you. Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Nay. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Davinshire. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. With 10 in favor and one opposed, the motion passes. So that's approved. Please continue to work with the staff on the finishes and detailing. Thank you. You're welcome. We'll move, we'll move to the next item. Okay, the next item is public hearing item number two, LPC 22-04318, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, block 176, lot 10, 300 State Street, the 300 State Street House individual landmark. This is an Italianate style row house built circa 1847 to 48. And the application is to replace a door. Okay, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Um, Nate, you have control of the presentation. You just need to click on your screen and then you can advance the slides using your arrow keys or your mouse. Uh, please state your name for the record and you may begin. I'm Nate Shelkoff. I represent the Brownstone Door Company, and our company specializes in the fabrication of historically significant entryways in New York City. Um, you can see our website, brownstonedoors.nyc, if you'd like to see what kind of projects we take on. As part of our design work, we conduct extensive historical and on-site research, and we do this by looking at New York City tax photos. Uh, we have a collection of 19th century door catalogs books and relevant newspaper archives, as well as a large collection of uh, moldings that we've lifted from uh, historic doors. The first slide shows our project, which is located at 300 State Street, and it is designated as a uh, individual landmark, and it's also on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, the scope of work for this project is replacing an existing full height double leaf wood entry door 
with a set of doors that match the adjacent properties at 302 and 298 State Street, both of which have a double door uh, with a transom configuration, which we're showing on our next slide. Uh, I hope you have a, a big display for this because this uh, slide's really rich in detail and context. Uh, we're showing here a streetscape photo of State Street um, consisting of uh, uniform brick row houses that were all built in the late 1840s and early 1850s. Now, 300 and 302 State Street are shown right in the middle of, of the image. Uh, each of these row houses was designated by Landmark Preservation Commission as an individual landmark. And according to the LPC designation report, which is also shown on this slide, the 300 State Street and 302 State Street row houses were built in 1848 as a pair of two adjoining Italianate houses. They were built for John Tao, who was a hardware merchant. Um, both of these houses have similar architectural features. For example, the entryway, they both feature a triangular pediment set above a frieze, which is supported on carved brackets. Uh, the same triangular pediment is also seen above the parlor floor windows. Now, in addition to being uh, an individual landmark, the State Street row houses are also on the National Register of Historic Places. And here we show the registry plaque for that. And as you can see on the lower left side of the photo is um, 300 State Street's entry and next to it a photo of the sister row house 302 State Street, which we are proposing to replicate. Now, slide LPC3 is interesting because when we consulted the 1940s historical tax photos to get a little historical perspective of the entryway of 300 State Street, um, you can see that in 300 and 302, the entry doors are actually open and the tax photo is showing the vestibule doors. And we find it's actually a really common practice for um, back then residents would leave the entry doors open during the day and they'd receive their visitors at the vestibule doors. And this is what allows the light to come in through the vestibule doors as those, those entry doors being open. Now, the majority of original row house doors are hinged on what you call an unswagged hinge. And that means that when the entry door opens, it, it nests into a little pocket, exactly the same way uh, pocket shutters on the interior fit into those little boxes alongside your window. And one of the reasons they did this is so that all the moldings would line up um, between the entry door and the vestibule door, and it made like a little lobby. So you often find a very strong agreement between this vestibule door and entry door paneling configuration, uh, which we're gonna show in the following slides. Now, 300 State Street still has the original vestibule doors that are shown in this tax photo, and that's very valuable to us. Um, as you can see in these historic photographs, all of the entryways at uh, 298, 302, and 304, which are the adjacent properties to the left and the right of our project, all have that transom above the double door. Now on our next slide, LPC4, we're showing images of the existing entry and vestibule doors at 300 State Street, as well as a close-up of that 1940s tax photo showing the vestibule doors. And as you can see, the existing vestibule door is the same door that's in the tax photo. Uh, the vestibule door is a really great example of 19th century Victorian style arch doors, very rich in detail. Uh, for example, I'd like to draw your attention to the beautiful applique that's on the door and how it's carried over to the door casing for continuity and visual impact, which was important because that's where people usually greeted their visitors when the entry doors were open during the day. Um, in contrast to the vestibule doors, the existing entry doors were designed to be less inviting and more imposing, giving a sense of security when they were closed. Um, these photographs show how the vestibule set um, of doors is very well preserved. And it's interesting, our client actually contacted us to make uh, new vestibule doors. But when we saw them in person, we told them, you can't replace these. Um, a recommendation is that we restore them and modify them to fit their needs. And we usually don't do restoration, but we made an exception because these doors are pretty exceptional. Now, another interesting feature of the Victorian door design is the continuity between the entry and the vestibule set, which we're showing on this slide, LPC5. Uh, many of the 19th century millwork and door catalogs that we have show that vestibule and entry doors were sold together as a set. And here you can see a couple pages from different catalogs showing the vestibule door and entry door. And if you notice, each set of doors share common features that create that continuity throughout the entryway. Um, this continuity is also visible on the entry doors at our project, 300 State Street where you can see similar but not identical features on the bottom uh, raised wood panels of, of both sets of doors. And as you'll see, in order to preserve this continuity, we've incorporated in the design of the, of the bottom panels of the vestibule doors, 
um, into the entry doors, along with replicating the door astragal and the molding profile. Now, in our next slide, LPC6, um, this shows a drawing of the existing entry and vestibule doors. Um, we're really meticulous about documenting uh, historical details. We're not gonna dwell on this too much, but it's a really nice drawing. Uh, the next slide, LPC7, uh, shows the drawing of the proposed entry configuration with uh, double doors and transom. The double doors and transom will be installed on the existing jam or enframement. Um, the enframement or door surround will be slightly modified for the sake of aligning the panels with the proposed entry door configuration. And on the next slide, LPC8, you can see the details of the proposed design. Uh, the doors to be fabricated and constructed of mahogany styles and rails. Uh, it'll have insulated glass units, making it more energy efficient. And the existing jam and enframement are going to be preserved and weather stripped. Um, here we show a photo of the molding profile on the uh, existing vestibule set. We intend to reproduce that exact same molding profile from the vestibule doors for the entry doors. And this will preserve that sense of continuity that should exist between the entry and vestibule doors. Uh, slide LPC9 shows the transom details. As you can see, we're proposing insulated glass unit for the uh, transom and a historic wooden profile that resembles blazing putty. Uh, sometimes we actually skim over the wood with a putty so it looks a little more historic. The next slide, LPC 10, shows some additional door details. Now, what, one of the four important features is that we're lowering the top flush bolts to uh, 60 inches to accommodate our client's needs as it's not possible for them to open the, the leaf right now. Uh, another element of the Victorian door design is to have the door panel configuration align with the panels on the enframement. Now in this slide, LPC7, um, we're showing a photograph of the existing enframement of the sister house 302 State Street. And I'd like to draw your attention to the uh, number of enframement panels uh, and how they align with the door and transom configuration. On the left, we show a rendering of the enframement that we are copying in this detail. Uh, we propose to fill in two areas of those enframement panels, effectively dividing the single large panel into three smaller ones each one perfectly aligned with their corresponding element on the face of the door, which makes it look truly historic. Uh, this slide shows the LPC designation photos of the 298, 300, 302, and 304 State Street. Now you might wonder why we're proposing making entry doors with a transom when the existing doors are historical. Well, before proposing any entrance uh, design, which differs from the existing historical model, we study the rest of the historical context to verify whether the proposed design fits within the context of the streetscape. And in this instance, since each row house is an individual landmark, we asked ourselves, how does it fit with the context of the other row houses? Would it be appropriate in configuration for the context of the neighboring houses? And from a contextual study presented here, we've confirmed that the proposed configuration fits here. As we demonstrated numbers 296, 298, 302, and 304 State Street, those are the two properties to the right and the left of our project, 300, all have the exact same configuration, double doors with a transom above. And while they're all unique in style, they all share that similar configuration. It's our project, it's a bit of the oddball. Um, our last slide, LPC 13, shows just how well that proposed configuration would fit in. Uh, look how well this door fits with the other four row houses. What we're proposing is to make it blend in seamlessly. We're gonna make it look like it's always been there using the exact same profiles, proportions, astragals, and bottom panel. The proposed design is truly consistent with the entrances of the adjacent properties and is appropriate to the building and the historic district. Thank you very much. And I just wanna note for the record that uh, Commissioner Devonshire is recused on this item and has not been present for the presentation and will not be present for the rest of the meeting. Commissioners, do we have any questions? Okay, I don't see any questions at this time. So why don't we move to public testimony? If you're in the meeting and would like to testify on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Sasha Seeley to take us through the testimony. All right, thank you. John Graham from Victoria, Victorian Society New York, you should be receiving a request from me now. Okay, John, I see you have accepted my request. You can go ahead and unmute your mic, please, and state your name for the record. You have three minutes. Good 
Good morning, commissioners. John Graham for the Victorian Society in New York. We were unable to discern from the presentation materials the reason for the proposed door replacement. We cannot imagine, however, any reason sufficient to justify the removal of this pair of extraordinarily beautiful, historic, apparently original doors. The designation report calls out the doors, noting how the pediments above the central panels echo the handsome brownstone doorway pediment. The proposed replacement doors are no substitute for the originals. Though they are nice enough and of a, gen of a generic sort, we would be happy with if the historic doors were missing. That the replacements would be made of tropical rainforest hardwoods, while the existing doors are old timber of a quality probably unobtainable today at any price, adds insult to injury. The VSNY strongly urges disapproval. Finally, I'll just note that everything the applicant said about the quality of the vestibule doors is matched by the quality of the original exterior doors. Thank you very much, commissioners. Ready, thank you. Let me just take a glance back over and see if there's anyone else who would like to testify. And I do not see any hands raised, so I will just add for the record that Brooklyn Community Board 2 approves of this application and I'll pass it back over to you, Chair Carroll. Right. Thank you very much, Sasha. Okay, I'd like to turn to the applicant and ask if you'd like to respond to the comments. Uh, yes, our client would just like to unify the look of their property with the adjacent properties, um, 296, 298, 302, and 304 State Street. And they would like a configuration that would lower the height of the entry doors and let more light in through a transom. And are the owners also interested in getting more light through the doors? Yes, that's the, the primary panel, not just at the transom, but you're doing a glazed panel too. Yes. Did you consider inserting a glazed panel within the existing doors, the two vertical panels? Uh, yes, we did. And uh, we were proposing uh, matching the adjacent properties doors. Um, All right. Can, can you speak to the condition of the existing doors? Um, they're, they're weathered on the interior. They've been, they've been shot up with a lot of different uh, hardware configurations, um, which, which is part of the reason why they'd like to replace it with new ones. All right, commissioners, any final questions? Okay, not seeing any questions. So I'm gonna start sending you requests to unmute so that we can close the hearing and begin our discussion. Okay, and Commissioner Chen, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you, Commissioner Chapin. Would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. Um, and as has been presented, this is a series of individual landmarks on State Street um, that all have sort of a variety of exterior and inner vestibule doors. And uh, the applicant is proposing to replace their exterior outer doors uh, with a new door in a configuration that is similar to some of the others within the row. So we'll begin that discussion. Commissioner Gustafson, would you like to start this one? Sure. Um... I think we're um, conflating, um, you know, the applicant may be conflating a couple of the different standards here. Um, when I, if we were looking at a, um, an historic district and, um, and this was the one unusual door, I might be more likely to say it should match. Um, however, um, that's not what's going on here. This is an individual landmark. Uh, this is, an, um, to our knowledge, an original set of doors, uh, and uh, um, and it is, um, and I think uh, I think as we just heard, uh, the door is actually in um, in fine condition, um, if if not if not better. Um, so um, I, I I don't see the justification for uh, for re for replace removing and replacing these doors. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Shamir Barron. Oh, I, I think I agree, though I, some, there's something um, sort of strange about this whole thing. I'm not sure what it is. Um, 
but I, I so I don't think so is so is the issue one of disrepair in other words if it was in terrible shape we would agree that it could be replaced and rebuilt and restored uh, right um, that would yes that would be yeah. the first question yeah so then it's it, so the question would re is really so it's contingent on the, sh the the kind of the shape that it's in rather than the um extent to which it could be properly um Re recreated or restore or or another you know right i think it's a sort of a two-part question yeah. the first first question is um if it's you know significant historic fabric and right. it's not deteriorated can you uh is replacement even warranted and then if you get to that point or, or find that it's okay for other reasons to remove the door then uh, then the question is, what should that door look like? Should yes. it be a replica? Should it be something like the other doors or should it be something in between? Right. So I, I guess I, I, I do then agree with Commissioner Gisipson that the historic and, and with what you're, you're describing as the kind of the first issue for our consideration, and that is whether or not the historic fabric should be removed if it is not warranted because it's in relatively good shape. And I, so I agree, it should not be removed. But I do want to say that I, um, I'm excited for and admire the, what seem, seems to be the, um, the spirit of, of good restoration work and, and um, great respect for historic examples in, in the work that the applicant is, um, seems to be doing. So I appreciate that very much, but I do agree that um, historic fabric in this case should not be removed, is not required. Okay, great. And I guess I just should further that to say, because th there are times when we do allow for the removal of historic fabric, right? Obviously to accommodate new uses and changes, but I, the question is, is, the fa is this particular fabric significant um, on its own? And, um, and sometimes we do consider sort of what um, are there no other alternatives? Sort of the need, the fees, of the, the the need question. Okay, um, Commissioner Holford Smith. Um, yes. Well, it you know appears that these doors are in relatively quite good condition actually, um, and appear to be historic. So I really can't find it appropriate to replace them. Um, it seems like the intention is really to get more light into the into the uh, house. Um, I think it could be appropriate to remove the center panel of each of the leaves and put glass there. Um, but that would be the extent, I think, of the of the alteration. Okay, thanks, Commissioner Chapin. Uh, yeah, I I agree. I think that uh, these are historic. Uh, they are in our normal situation, when we see that something is uh, historic and in, in re restorable condition, uh, we ask people to retain. And so I really don't see them uh, removing these doors. However, I think that uh, if they need additional light, that a glass panel uh, and uh, possibly uh, the transom and the panels themselves, the upper panels could be replaced because that is pretty uh, typical of some of the other uh, installations in similar doors. And so I think that could be that could be done to permit a greater light into the vestibule area. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Goldblum. I agree. Uh, I don't have anything to add. Okay, and would you also agree that the doors could be modified if they needed more light to have? Absolutely, them? yes. Okay. I think that the idea of removing that large panel is, is totally acceptable to me. Okay, great. Commissioner um, Chen. Yeah, I, it seems like there's a, a majority consensus. So, uh, you know, uh, so uh, I, I will go along with the majority. Commissioner Latfi. Uh, I agree. I think it, the door should be preserved and the panels can be replaced with glass. Okay. Commissioner Jefferson. I agree the door should be preserved and the glass panel could be installed. Okay. 
Okay. All right. So I think we are in agreement that um, that these doors are significant and that they're the front door of this facade. And so one of the more decorative elements of the facade and that their condition doesn't warrant their replacement. However, we um, could support uh, removing the solid panels and the solid upper panels and replacing them with glazing if, if, uh, if they needed more light. Okay, Commissioner Gustafson, would you make the motion? Certainly. In the matter of uh, LPC 22-04318, 300 State Street, the 300 State Street House, an individual landmark, the application is to replace a door. Um, um, I recommend denial, uh, finding that the existing front doors are not beyond reasonable repair, that the proposed work will remove significant historic fabric, that the inner vestibule doors visible in the 1940s tax photograph and the exterior doors share similar design motifs and details, implying that they were installed as a set and are historic and integral to the building's design, that the details on the existing exterior doors featuring bracketed pediments over wood paneling relates to the bracketed pediment above the entrance and the pediments above the parlor floor windows, and the proposed replacement doors lack this pediment detail and therefore the work will diminish a cohesive design and that the work will detract from the significant historic and architectural character of this individual landmark. However, I know if the intent of the work is to provide transparency as the applicant has stated and light into the vestibule, um, I recommend that the applicant retain and repair the existing historic doors and remove the solid wood at the upper panels to install clear glazing. Thank you. And uh, Commissioner Chen? Right. Sorry, Commissioner Chen, would you second that motion? Okay. okay. Mark, will you call the vote? Well, just want to make sure, are we denying this or are we approving we, with modifications? We're denying it, but okay. saying that the, we would approve a glazed we'll panel, back. which, well, okay. we, no, we would approve a glazed plant panel that can be worked out with the staff. Okay. Okay. Um, I just want to make sure that was clear. Okay. Um, Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. He's gone for the day. Oh, Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Oh, he's recused. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. <laughs> Aye. Uh, with nine in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. That's denied, but please continue to work with the staff if, the, if your clients do uh, want to have more transparency and light, you may make a modification to the existing doors. Okay, we'll move to the next item. The next item is public hearing item number three, um, LPC 22-04683. Application for a Certificate of Appropriateness in the Borough of Brooklyn, Block 436, Lot 69, 305 President Street in the Carroll Gardens Historic District. This is a row house built in 1876, and the application is to construct rooftop and rear yard additions and a shed. Okay, Commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Uh, Nicholas, you have control of the presentation. You can advance the slides using your arrow keys or the mouse. Please state your name for the record, and you may begin. Nicholas, you're muted. Nicholas, please don't hit escape and please unmute yourself. You'll need to click on your screen again. Mm -hmm. Great, we can hear you now. Okay, Thank yeah, you. I have that problem every time. I'm not really sure why that happens. Okay, sorry about that. Hi, my name is uh, Nicholas Brown, I'm the architect uh, working with the owners of 305 President Street. I'm here to review uh, three items. First is the proposed two-story rear addition. The second is the proposed rooftop addition. And the third is a proposed accessory structure in the rear yard. Uh, this project is located in the Carroll Gardens Historic District and is community board number six. Historic context, again, this is the Carroll Gardens Historic District, which is defined by this red boundary and the project location highlighted here in black. And then on the right is the 1940s tax photo. Uh, it's not part of this hearing, but it is an important part of the project is the restoration of the front facade. Uh, we're gonna be restoring all the original brownstone details around the windows and doors 
and the original railings will all be restored uh, and reviewed with the staff. Existing context street view, uh, this image on the top is the view along President Street with the project location highlighted here. And then the image at the bottom is the view along Union Street, again, with the project location highlighted. And this is to illustrate that the rear facade and rear yards are not visible from any public right of way. Uh, block plan aerial view, this is the view above, um, giving more context of the block and the project location here. And again, as you can see, there's no visibility um, from any public right on Union or Smith. And then the rear facades, these are images uh, showing the more detail of the rear facade. The bottom left showing the starting at the corner of Hoyt and President and working our way down the block. As you can see, there are a variety of additions currently in place along these facades, some two story, single story, half width. Um, in the bottom right image, again, continuing down the block, uh, top left, um, more, more views down the block, and then the top right showing our project location here. As you can see, um, as you get closer to the corner, there is a shift in scale and we're kind of sandwiched between these two taller buildings. And then we're also at a row, at the end of the row of these bay windows. And then this is a drawing of the block again, showing the existing building highlighted in black and the proposed addition in dark blue. The lighter blue images are uh, other additions along the block, and then the green, uh, the deck and stairs to the rear yard. And then this is a rear panoramic view uh, to give more detail of what's going on in these rear facades. I mean, as you can see, there is a series of bay windows and we are the last in that series. And then as we shift up in scale, uh, building to the right extends past our rear facade and both neighboring buildings are story higher. Uh, there's an existing sunroom, which will be removed. The existing fire escape will be removed. Um, and then you can see the existing bay window. And our proposal is to rebuild and extend this bay window, but aligning with the building to the right. Again, the re existing rear elevation, um, showing the sunroom and this fire escape that'll be removed and then the form of the bay window, which will be replicated. And then the proposed rear elevation, it's a little bit, hard to read in 2D, but we do have some 3D images that help illustrate it. Uh, but essentially recreating this bay window and extending it out, it's a modest extension, only about six foot nine inches to align with the building to the right. Um, we're you know, recreating the bay window. So there's this motif of three windows that we wanna continue through the facade with the composition of all the other uh, windows. So starting on the garden level, we have three patio doors that walk out to the rear yard on the parlor level two fixed windows, and then a door that walks out to a stair to the rear yard. Um, the extension creates a little roof deck for the second floor, uh, some lift and slide doors that open up to walk out. Um, and again, all the new openings, um, the second floor aligns with the windows above the existing third floor windows. The detailing of the head and sill is gonna match the existing stone head and sill. Uh, the third floor windows being, not changing the windy opening, just replacing with a, you know, a new wood double hung window. And then the rooftop addition, the height uh, aligning with the adjacent buildings. Um, but the, the line of the rear face of this addition is set back from the rear facade, which maintains that clear articulation of the existing brick cornice. And I'll get into more material details with the renderings, but so this is the existing zoning diagram. Again, as you can see the existing bay window and plan and then in section above and then the proposed zoning and diagrams, which is you know, maintaining that bay window form, but extending it out to align with our neighbor to the, left, to the right. Um, which I, the accessory structure, which I'll get to towards the end of the presentation is located here in the rear yard. And then in the section, again, you can see the rear extension proposal and then the rooftop addition. Now the rooftop addition, we are pulling it back from the rear facade you know, to articulate that existing cornice. And then also on the front, we're pulling it back uh, far enough so that we maintain a non-visibility from any view along President Street on the sidewalk across from the property. And then getting back to some more image details of the rear facade, uh, the image on the right, as you can see the existing bay window um, and our proposal is to extend that out to align with the building to the right. 
So here's some 3D renderings, which help illustrate the design a little more clearly. The one on the left is the view from above. Again, that form of the bay window being extended out to the building to the right. Um, and then, you know, the image to the right is the view from the rear yard. Uh, starting on the bottom again, you, see you have the three doors that walk out to the rear yard, the fixed panels and the door to the deck. Um, and then the upper patio that's created from uh, the extension, the three lift and slide doors, which align with the existing windows above. Then also you can see here the, the brick cornice and how the rooftop addition is pulled back so that allows that line to, main, to be maintained. Um, the materials of the rooftop addition is a black standing seam metal. Um, the windows, again, two casement windows, which are the same proportion and alignment of the uh, double hung windows below with the fixed window in the middle. Uh, the railings, again, we have a vertical black steel or painted steel uh, with a Ipe cap and then horizontal stainless steel cables, which has helped to lighten the weight of the actual railing. And then for the front facade, um, this is a drawing showing, you know, the restoration work that we're going to be doing with staff, uh, the, the brownstone details in the cornice, and then the front view of the addition, again, set back so it's not visible from any public right of way. Um, and then again, the same material as the rear, the black standing seam metal. We have two sliding doors over fixed panels. And again, 3D helps illustrate a little bit better. The image on the left view from above, um, that setback creating this little uh, patio area with uh, concrete pavers on uh, leveling feet, the black standing seam um, paneling, and then the two sliding doors over the fixed panels. And then the view to the right, again, a little more detail, same detail as the railing in the rear with the stainless steel cables, the vertical black um, metal and the Ipe cap. And then the concrete uh, pavers for the patio, the sliding doors, and then the skylight hatch for the rooftop maintenance. So this is the um, views from the mock-up. The top left is the drawing showing the uh, proposal for the mock-up, again, showing the, the front of the addition being set back and the rear as well being set back. The bottom left is the view towards President Street, again highlighted in orange to help define the mass. And then the middle image is looking towards the rear and the bottom left again, looking towards the rear, a little more detail showing how it's set back from the rear facade. And then with the um, Mock-up in place, these photos were taken along President Street, the white arrow highlighting the project, uh, sequentially walking down the block, showing that the addition is not visible from anywhere along President Street. And then the last item is this uh, accessory garden structure. Uh, the image in the top right uh, shows the proposed structure. Um, we have an Ipe wood fence that will be left natural to create, you know, to have a natural silvery patina. Um, again, an Ipe deck, and then the accessory structure is shown as an ebony stained cider in a vertical pattern to create a little contrast and balance to the existing silvery wood of the Ipe. Um, there's a flush door with a viewing window on the front, a side little viewing window that looks out towards the garden, and then a rooftop operable skylight to allow natural air and ventilation within the shed. And then the same standing seam metal for the roof material that is on the um, the, the proposed roof addition. And then the section on the right shows we're maintaining the, we're staying below the max eight foot height. Um, it's a simple wood frame structure that'll be attached to the concrete slab for the deck, which has the Ipe on top, um, and then the operable skylight. And that's uh, pretty much the presentation. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, do we have any questions? I don't think we have questions at this time. We'll move to public testimony and we may have questions after that. So if you're in the meeting and would like to testify on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you and I'll turn it over to Sasha Seely to take us through the testimony. All right, thank you. Mark Bench from the Victorian Society of New York. You should be receiving a request from me. Okay, Mark, I see that you have accepted my request. Please just unmute your mic and state your name for the record. Then you can begin your testimony. Thank you, Sasha. Good. Uh, this is Mark Bench. Good morning, Chair Carroll Commissioners. This is Mark Bench for and on behalf of the Victorian Society of New York. The application for work at 305 President Street 
has several independent elements which we believe require independent responses. Approval for the first two, denial of the second two. The applicant proposes to construct a rooftop addition which will be set between and approximately the same height as the top floors of the adjacent row houses, two adjacent row houses. The mock-up indicates the addition will not be visible from any public way and is set back from the front and rear facades. We therefore find this addition appropriate. The second part is the construction of a shed at the rear of the property line. The work will not require the removal of any historic material, is modestly scaled, and is the type of small structure which can be found behind many historic buildings. We have no objection to the proposed shed. The third change is the proposed paving of the entire rear yard. Commissioners, this row house is in Carroll Gardens. That name refers to the deep areaway gardens found in front of these houses, but the rear gardens are also a significant feature of the district. We ask that the proposal be modified to include large planting areas. Finally, the applicants are proposing a two-storey rear yard addition, which will require the destruction of the original two-storey bay window, which is not only a significant feature, as defined by the Commission's window rules, but is also one of the major unifying elements in this row. Please look at board L-07, <laughs> which shows the rear facades of the row. The applicant has a label which gives their opinion that the existing fire escapes and decks disrupt the bay window pattern. But in fact, the pattern is clearly visible, as are the matching paired windows, the matching stone lintels and sills, and the matching corbelled brick cornices, which give this small row such unity and dignity. Further, because the applicants are proposing to remove their fire escape, the historic two-storey bay will become fully vis visible and, we hope, set a precedent for the removal of the other fire escapes. The applicant's proposal to recreate the two-storey bay in the wrong plane, in the wrong location, will go in the opposite direction, diminishing the unity of the row while removing historic fabric. We ask that this portion of the proposal be denied. Thank you. Thank you. Let me take a glance back over and see if I have any more hands raised and I do not see any more hands raised. So I will just add for the record that Brooklyn Community Board 6 recommends that the railings on the roof deck and rear deck be metal with vertical pickets that are painted black for consistency in the district. And now I will pass it back over to you, Chair Carroll. Okay, thank you. All right, so I'd like to turn to the applicant and ask if you'd like to respond to the comments we've heard. Um, I don't have any response now, no. Okay, um, well, do you wanna address the, um, I know that you did present the bay window and uh, right. in, the, in your, then address that in your presentation that you're retaining the form in, in your proposed edition. Yeah, I mean, there, we, the first time we had done this, we, you know, we were looking at other ways of doing this rear addition, which is necessary for the owners because the parlor level, this is a narrower townhouse. so. They needed more space, living space on that parlor level. Um, the initial designs we were looking at, we, you know, we're not recreating the bay and that didn't seem right historically. So this was our solution to be able to fix the problem of getting more space on the parlor and the garden level for the rental unit, um, but still trying to maintain that historic form and the, and the fabric that's there currently. Okay, and then with respect to the community board's concerns on the railings, I think. Um, yeah, the original railings were glass. Um, so we understand that. I mean, the, the original concept with the glass railing is that it would be less visible, especially from this rear facade, so that the cornice of the bay window could really be highlighted. Um, so we, you know, we looked at the vertical picket, which was their suggestion, but it just visually felt too heavy. And again, so like the, the vertical steel with the stainless steel cables gave it a lighter weight. So that's where the direction we wanted to explore. Okay, so that you sort of do maintain that kind of apparent height of- Exactly, yeah. We don't want it to feel the height to be extended up more. Okay. All right, commissioners, any final questions? All right, I'm starting to send you requests on mute so that we can move to close the hearing and begin our discussion. <coughs> 
All right. And Commissioner Goldblum, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Jefferson, would you second that motion? Second the motion. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. Um, we have two components to this application, the rooftop addition and the removal of the bay and the construction of a new rear yard addition that has a bay. And uh, both uh, components are not visible from any public thoroughfare. And um, similar to uh, your question, Mr. Commissioner Shamir Barron earlier about the doors, you know, the commission has approved removing historic fabric on other buildings. And so it's a question of how significant is that fabric to the understanding of the building and um, as well as condition. And uh, on, uh, in particular, the commission has approved the removal in some cases of bay windows and non-visible rear facades um, or, and, or have allowed the removal and uh, have actually required that applicants construct an addition with a uh, bay to replace the one that's being removed. So this is a solution that we've actually required of other applicants in the past. Um, the, the community board had comments about the railing. Um, and we had a discussion about cable wire railings this morning. So I'm sure that will factor into our discussion as well today. Um, but I, I, as you know, I feel that the cable wire, cable, cable wire railing is, um, a, a way of achieving a lighter, more transparent feel that allows one to appreciate the height better. So, but I know there may be different thoughts on that. So why don't we begin our discussion? Commissioner Lutfi, would you start this one? Sure. Well, I have to say that I think this is very well done. <laughs> and, um, I, I believe that what they, first of all, nothing is, and I think that's very important. Um, secondly, I think that the, the bay windows at the back recall what was there. And we, we have approved, and, and, and as you said, uh, Sarah, we, have, we have sometimes require that applicants do this. I can appreciate the fact that this is a very narrow building and that and we have been flexible about, um, as we look at projects um, and consider these types of situations because, um, you know, we want to retain the character of what's there while enabling people to live in uh, a more uh, modern way. Um, and so I, I think that that works. I think that the, 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 actually the back, the whole back of the house, uh, from, uh, above that, uh, <laughs> above those first two floors, uh, speaks directly to, uh, the building that's next to it. <laughs> and the uh, roof addition looks great. I, I do, I don't have a problem with the cable wiring here at all. I think it's a nice light touch. I thought it would be nice. And I don't know if this is uh, something that we're, um, we're um, addressing, but I do think it would be nice if there was some kind of greenery in the backyard. I, I don't have a problem with the shed at the back. Okay, thank you. And I'm, I'm glad you raised that because I neglected to say that is the third component is the shed in the back. Mm -hmm. um, with respect to the planting versus non-planting, that is something that we have historically have not um, reviewed at commission level. Um, we do review excavation that would prevent future planting, um, but we don't review the <coughs> treatment at the sort of the rear yard, whether it's pavers or grass or plantings, um, but we will certainly note that, um, that yeah, you think that it would be nicer to have green in the backyard. Okay, Commissioner Jefferson. Um, a carefully designed project, and let me start with the shed. The shed is 
a small little project, but it has a lot of character. Very well done, I think, for such a small project. The rooftop edition, I think it's fine. I think it works. Um, <coughs> the backyard paving, I, um, I'm somewhat on the fence because I think planting, you know, it is Carroll Gardens. So I, I would love to see some planting there if possible. Uh, the bay window, I think, is appropriate and works very well. They they made it a bit bigger, and it 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 it, it the doorway to the stair works well, nicely designed. Um, uh, and and I also said the, the proposed rooftop and rear yards addition will not be visible from public thoroughfares. It's a very nice project from my point of view. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Gustafson. Uh, I'll break it down the way the Victorian Society did. The rooftop addition, I think, is perfectly fine. Um, the shed is fine. Um, I am not going to comment on the uh, uh, planting. Um, the, re the rear addition is certainly designed nicely. Um, however, um, the, the bay window is, um, in, to my mind, a significant feature. And it is, um, I think the applicant may even have said this, it's a unique unifying feature. And, um, and uh, with the row, um, and uh, typically when we require, in quotations, um, that a, a bay window be replaced with another similar, um, um, structure, similarly designed structure, um, the first thing we're talking about is that the existing window is beyond, bay window is beyond repair. Um, and, um, and I don't know that, that, I certainly don't think that's the case here. Uh, so I, I'm okay with the rooftop addition in the shed, but I am I'm not okay with the removal of the uh, and replacement of the bay window. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Shamir Barron. I think I am uh, find most everything appropriate. And I, I would have had a similar concern about the bay window, but this is not an individual landmark. And I think there are other... Um, situations here uh, that makes it a different situation than the previous project where we considered the removal of historic material. Um, I do have a little bit of an issue with the way that the bay meets the ground. It, there seems to be something strange there and that the bay would, I think, typically have some kind of a bulkhead or wouldn't even be a, you know, doors on, sort of all the way to the ground on, in all, on all sides. I don't think that this is something that you know, calls really undue attention to itself, can't really be seen, isn't anything beyond, you know, the, kind of the scope and the, the extent of other things that we've seen in rear yards. So I don't have a huge problem with it, don't think it makes it inappropriate, but I think it's a little bit of an awkward condition. Thank you. Commissioner Holford smith Yeah, I was a little conflicted about this one, um, given the sort of purity of the, of the row, with no rooftop additions, um, but the fact that it's nestled in with these two taller buildings and um, one of the buildings, it looks like there was originally a mansard and one of the buildings adjacent rebuilt the mansard. So it's possible that this building had that as well. Um, so I think I can improve the rooftop addition. Um, I have no problem with the shed. Um, and was a little conflicted about the, the bay, um, but I think the fact that it's at the end of the row and it's flush with the adjacent building and they're recreating it that I can find this addition to be appropriate. Thank you. Commissioner Chapin. Uh, yes, uh, I agree. Uh, and particularly, uh, I also had the same uh, feeling that the fact that this is next to the, is the end of the row next to a bigger building that it is okay to have it be slightly extended. Uh, and I approved the shed. I think that the, the uh, job, I think everything was done very, very nicely in this design. So I can approve it as presented. Okay, Commissioner Goldblum. Uh, I'm I'm with John G on this one. I I think that the I think the rooftop is acceptable because of the uh, the, the the streetscape. Even though they there haven't I'm, I, like Anne said, there haven't been uh, rooftop additions. But because this one's lower and there's mansards or taller buildings to either side, I think the rooftop additions okay. I think that the bay window though, 
is a distinctive feature. And I remember in several other cases having uh, required applicants to retain uh, bay windows like this and restore them. Uh, that said, I could I could mm -hmm. accept having it removed on this on the basement level and preserving it on the first floor. I think that would be sufficient to retain the pattern and the row uh, as it's experienced from the uh, from the common space in the back. So I would I would just a ask them to to relocate it on the piano nobile and not not on the basement level. Commissioner Devonshire. I'm okay with the uh, rooftop addition. I'm, I, I think the shed is fine. Um, I agree that the, uh, that bay is a distinctive feature of this building. There, there's no evidence that it is not reparable. And so I am against the, uh, the bay window transformation. Okay. And, um, and, and I, you know, I sort of, think about this bay a little bit differently, um, sort of knowing how we have thought about it. And I do want to know, uh, um, like the, the testimony from Victorian Society described the rules talking about bay windows, that the bay windows are no longer defined actually as significant under the window rules. But I wouldn't think of this myself necessarily as a bay window. This is a more to me like a masonry extension, a bay an extended uh, sort of faceted masonry extension. And so I think for me, the idea of it um, being extended out and maintaining its form maintains the sort of characteristic of, of it and the scale and character of this row house within this historic district, this block. Um, and also noting that it aligns with the adjacent building. And <clears throat> similarly, the rooftop addition is um, set back from the front and rear, preserving the original volume of the building and not visible from any way, public way. So I would support it as well, but I think that we should ask them to, um, uh, uh, I think that, that while we have some who would not support the rear yard addition, I think we have enough to support it. So I would suggest that we make a motion to approve, but with the modification that they continue to um, work with the staff to resolve the base of the extension as Commissioner Shamir Barron suggested, and that they explore more planting in the rear yard as uh, Commissioner Lutfi and Jefferson suggested. So Commissioner Lutfi, would you make that motion? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, in the matter of docket 22-04683-305 President Street, Carroll Gardens Historic District, a row house built in 1876. The application is to construct a rooftop and rear yard addition and a shed. I know that the building style scale, materials and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Carroll Gardens Historic District. I recommend approval uh, with some modifications finding that the proposed rooftop and rear yard additions will not be visible from public thoroughfare. That the faceted profile and two story height of the rear yard addition featuring brick cladding with punched openings will recall the scale and character of the original bay while maintaining the original upper floors of the row house and its relationship to the rest of the row that the depth of the addition will be consistent with the varying projections of existing rear extensions in this block, only half of which is in the historic district and the proposed addition will not diminish the central green space, that the proposed fenestration, I think rear yard addition will retain the same general shape and pattern as the historic openings and that the enlarged openings at the second floor will be in keeping with the neighbor to the east while maintaining the existing masonry outer piers, that the rooftop addition will be modest in size and set back from the front and rear facades and thereby not, not overwhelming the house and maintaining a sense of its original massing, that the rooftop addition will feature a simple design as well as cladding materials and finishes, which are typ typical rooftop additions in the district and will not detract from the building or historic district, that the proposed wood rear yard shed is modest in size and design and, and that while it will be set 
along a portion of the rear lot line. It will be in keeping with typical utilitarian rear yard structures and will not significantly alter the relationship of this yard to the neighboring yards and that the work will not detract from the special architectural and historic character of the Carroll Yard uh, Gardens Historic District. I recommend that the applicant uh, continue to work with staff to resolve the base of the building and also uh, to explore uh, more plantings in the rear yard. Commissioner Jefferson, would you second that motion? We second the motion. Okay, and Mark, will you call the vote? Mayor Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. He's gone. Oh. Commissioner Devonshire. Nay. Commissioner Goldblum. Nay. Commissioner Gustafson. Nay. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. With six in favor and three opposed, the motion passes. Okay, so that's approved. Please continue to work with the staff. And we have one more item before we break for lunch. Okay, we'll move to public hearing item number four, LPC 21 08923, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, block 5203, lot 27. 1725 New Kirk Avenue in the Ditmas Park Historic District. This is a colonial revival style freestanding house designed by R.J. Schaefer and built in 1913. And the application is to install solar panels. Okay, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Uh, Matthew, you now have control of the presentation. You just need to click on your screen and then you can advance the slides using your arrow keys or, or your mouse. Um, please unmute yourself and state your name for the record, and then you may begin. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, thank you for meeting us today. Uh, my name is Matthew Mathosian, and I'm here from Sologistics, representing the client as the applicant of record and expediters for the proposed installation of a 10.5 kW solar electric system. The... Um, the proposed system is visible from the streets. Um, it's one of the reasons why we're here today. We did try to minimize visibility as much as possible. Um, the project location is on the edge of the historic district um, on the corner of Newkirk and East 18th Street. Um, the visibility, we tried to minimize um, the arrays to the back of the home and the uh, west side of the front of the home uh, behind the dormer. Um, if we take a look at the pictures and renderings of the project, um, when you're heading down Newkirk Ave, there is a house directly adjacent to the building. We had originally proposed panels on the dormer um, on the west side, as well as on the corner of Newcork and 18th, East 18th Street, looking at the front of the home on both the dormer and the main roof. Um, that system would have covered 100% of our uh, client's usage, but uh, just to minimize visibility and kind of come to a sort of a um, compromise, we removed some of the more visible panels and we're still able to cover 78% of the client's electricity usage. So the panels on the front of the home um, are only visible when you're standing directly um, in front of it. Uh, there is a large tree that would be covering that, that view from the uh, street during the summer months. So really it's only a couple of months a year where if somebody's walking that, down that road, the only time you'll see those panels is right when you get to the front of the house and you have to turn your head to actually see them. On the back of the home, if you're coming down East 18th Street, the array is a little bit more visible. Um, we tried to maintain um, the array in as, as much of a rectangle as we could. Um, there's a chimney and some vent pipes that you know would prevent that from being a complete rectangle, but we, we maintained that uh, straight edge along the street side um, and an all black panel um, to blend in with the gray roof as well as the roof next to it. Um, these next set of photos just show um, where we would run our conduit would again be, you'd have to be directly in front of the house to see it. We, we'd stick to the back 
west the west north corner of the home and run the conduit down um, where the gutter is. And it's obviously it will be an aluminum conduit, so it'll be gray or silverish to kind of blend in with that trim. Um, the only other piece of conduit that you would see would be over the ridge. There's um, we're maintaining a three foot setback for FDNY guidelines and um, also for the FDNY guidelines. Any conduit on the roof has to paint, be painted red. So you'll see a, maybe a one inch pipe, three feet long over the ridge on both sides. Um, and that's, that's really, in our opinion, the only I saw that, you know, that would possibly um, be a hindrance, but um, we try our best to hide that uh, where it's less of a view as possible. Um, the panels that we're using, so well, as far as the, the rest of the condo run, we're going to go straight down that side of the building into the basement, and then everything else will be inside. The equipment that we're tying into is actually on the opposite side of the home. Um, so instead of running condo with all of the roof, we'll just drop it down that back corner and then immediately enter the building. The panels themselves, as far as the roof details go, it's a very slim line panel um, that's only going to be raised six inches off the roof. Um, the panel is one inch thick, so one and a half inches thick, so you'll have about a four inch gap um, between the bottom of the panel and the roof surface. Um, we, we, we wanted to use a skirt to kind of hide that, but unfortunately, the panels that we're using, um, it's, the, it's the actual manufacturer who sold the job, so we're using these panels. Um, but the panels that we are using are some power. They are some of the sleekest panels on the market. Um, they have an all black frame, all black back sheet and a black cell. So um, along with the gray, gray roof, you know, we shouldn't have any problems as far as the panels standing up, standing out as, as much as others do. Uh, as far as production goes, like we said, this configuration uh, minus this one panel over here, we're gonna make this rectangular. So it's a you know, nicer array in the front, but regardless, we'll still be able to cover 78% of the customer's usage. And um, we also had a, a precedent of a system that was installed back in 2017, which is in the same district, um, in the middle of the district, which had, uh, I believe these look like the same panels actually. Um, they are visible from both sides of the street. Um, and um, this was approved. So we were just hoping this would be helpful as a precedent uh, as you make your decision. Uh, so that's really all we have from us and uh, happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Commissioners, do we have any questions? Yes, Commissioner Devonshire. You have four panels on the opposite slope of the roof. Why can't they go on the porch roof below the uh, array that you already have? Because uh, that the second story roof, um, since that array is facing north, we have, um, can I still uh, operate the slides here? Uh, yeah. So we did take that in consideration, um, but because it is facing north and it is a lower roof, that, that roof would be completely shaded um, and it wouldn't receive any sun during, during most of the year. Thank you. Commissioner Chapin. Yeah, my question is about colors for so solar panels. I understand that uh, there are a variety of colors being developed. I realize that sometimes these may not be as efficient uh, for light capture as say black. Um, and I was just curious about whether anyone is working on sort of a dark gray or something that might be a little more compatible with a lot of roofs that you see since very few roofs, very few roofs are actually gonna be black obviously. And of course, there's a reflective quality. So even if it were a different color, you're still gonna be able to observe the solar panel. But could you just comment on what's going on in uh, color development on, uh, since I think we're gonna see more and more of the uh, solar panels as we go along. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so there, there are two types of cells and that's really what, the, what's, what makes up the most visibility of the panel. So the actual cells themselves, you have the monocrystalline, which is what is being used here, which you, you see is either a very dark blue yeah. or black. And then you have, uh, and these are actually more right. efficient. And then you have the amorphous cells, which almost look like crystals themselves. And they can be all different shades of colors. They can be 
blue and black and, and darker grays, but they're mixed together. And they're actually, they're more of an eyesore that's, and they have more of a reflectivity to them. Um, so the cells themselves, as far as those two types, I don't think the, co the colors won't change. You know, I don't think it's something that, you know, they can die or it's, uh, it, it's, it's actually a crystal. So it, it's, it's something that's grown. Um, the, fr the frames themselves and the back sheets, those are something that, that can be controlled by the manufacturer. The benefit of having a black back sheet is it captures more of the light. Um, I don't know of any panels that are using back sheets other than black or white. Um, so, you know, it's something that we can definitely bring up that we were seeing in New York City uh, that, you know, that, that is a concern to certain districts. The frame color itself, that's also something that we haven't really seen them test different options other than black or silver. Um, so it's, it is something that we're aware of. I don't know if, if, if us saying anything is going to get the manufacturer to, 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 you know, put together a whole new assembly line, but, um, those are the two major options. And unfortunately there isn't really much more than that. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Commissioner Jefferson. Commissioner Jefferson, just unmute yourself. The, the scale of the panels, these panels seem to be about two by three. Can they be smaller at smaller scale? So the roofing, the scale of the roofing and the, roof, and the scale of the panels be compatible or that's very difficult to do? Uh, no, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be possible to do in this scenario. Um, these, act, these panels are actually bigger than, um, two by three, I believe they're about three by five. Um, and that's just a, an industry standard. You know, you're, you're gonna see panels within that range of, you know, three by five, four by six, um, nothing really smaller than the three by five. There are solar shingles obviously, but um, those are less efficient and they're not offered by this manufacturer. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay, I don't see any other questions right now. So why don't we move to public testimony? If you're in the meeting and would like to testify on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Sasha Seeley to take us through the testimony. Great, thank you. Mark Bench from Victorian Society of New York. You should be receiving a request from me now. Okay, Mark, I see you have accepted my request. Please just unmute your mic and state your name for the record. You have three minutes. Thank you, Sasha. Good afternoon, Commissioners and Chair Carroll. This is Mark Bench for the Victorian Society of New York. Alterations to single family houses on corner lots often present unique problems as visibility from a public way, as defined in the rules, is such an important factor in determining if a proposed change is appropriate. Work which is acceptable for a house set mid lock, where three out of the four facades are concealed by adjacent houses might not be on a corner where three out of the four facades are clearly visible. 1725 Newkirk is in this situation and because the massive roof of this colonial revival house is such an important element of the original design, the installation of anything on the roof becomes problematic. Additions to the carefully balanced symmetrical front facade, so typical of colonial revival buildings, are especially troubling. The four panels proposed for the front of the roof will diminish that symmetry and add an unacceptably modern element to the front facade. These panels should be eliminated from the project. The installation of the panels on the rear is trickier because of the corner lot. We note that the dark roof shingles and the simplicity of the side and rear facades mitigate the effect of the solar panels at the rear but the installation would still be quite visible and obviously modern and conflicts with the primary historic preservation mandate of the commission. We wonder whether the garage visible in the photo in the lower right corner of board four belongs to this house. And if it does, whether solar panels might be installed on the pitched roof of this smaller secondary structure. Thank you. All right, thank you. 
let me just take a glance back over and see if I have any more hands raised. And I do not see that, if, that there's anyone else that wishes to speak on this item. So I will add for the record that Brooklyn Community Board 14 waives their review on landmark application. So we do not have a resolution on file for this item, but we did receive three letters of support from neighbors. And now I will pass it back over to you, Chair Carroll. Okay, thank you. I'd like to ask the applicant if you would like to address any of the comments or questions that we heard in the testimony. Uh, I would just say that energy is very important uh, right now. And, um, you know, we see a, a lot of um, a lot of homes in these districts applying for solar. Um, we've seen them get approved. And um, we did our best to minimize the visibility. Um, like, like we said, there's from the front roof, we eliminated some arrays and the arrays that we are uh, leaving on the front are minimally visible from the street. Um, in the rear array, um, you know, there's really no way to avoid that. But um, even I mean, even that array facing north is, is suboptimal. But we, you know, we're still able still able to cover the majority of the client's usage. So, um, yeah, we we'll just say that um, we did our best, and um, we're hoping you consider that. Okay, thank you, commissioners. Any final questions? All right, so I am starting to send you all request to unmute so that we can begin our discussion. Commissioner Gustafson, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So um, we'll begin our discussion, and this is, as the applicant presented, not the first time that we have seen solar panels in this district or elsewhere on other dis in other districts, either with attached houses or detached houses. Um, this is in this particular case, the roof material is not historic fabric. Um, the view over the front is um, from a, a limited view to one side and the back is more open as it is a corner property. Um, but one thing I would say is that I have now seen, we approved a while ago an installation of solar panels on um, half of a roof in Sunnyside Gardens, which I have now seen installed and, and go by it regularly. And um, in that case, the roof did have um, slate and we approved it over the slate. And, uh, the building was perpendicular to the street. It was an end house of a muse that was perpendicular to the street. So it's as the end house is sits on uh, the main street. And so that uh, that rear facade and that portion of the roof is as visible as this is. And while a different building, an attached brick building, it is also colonial revival in style. And I have to say, when you see it now, it really reads as sort of a, a modern green technology that aligns with and respects the form of the roof and um, doesn't detract from the building or the rest of the row in any way, in my opinion. So I think that there are ways for this, this commission to embrace uh, modern technology, especially you know, sustainable technology um, in our historic settings without um, detracting from the historic features. So again, um, there are no historic shingles on, on uh, this roof and it's really sort of about the visibility and how you see it. So we'll begin our discussion. Um, Commissioner Chapin, would you like to start this one? Uh, okay. Um, I, I am, you know, in general, very much in favor of us trying to find ways to uh, implement green technology. And I I think that uh, what's important as we do that is that we limit the visibility as much as is practical and make suggestions if there are alternatives uh, to placement. And I also think that, uh, you know, you, you're also looking at what is practical because uh, you need a certain number of these panels to achieve, uh, you know, something that is worth doing to begin with. Uh, in this case, because it's a corner building, it's more difficult. 
I personally don't have any problem with the ones on the back. I actually think that that is acceptable without any question. Um, the one on the front, I think because it's only visible from the one side, uh, from the side angle, um, I can accept that. Um, and that the, because the additional panel is necessary. I didn't ask the question as to whether one could like in the, I'll put some on the roof of the back, um, uh, the back aspect, there's a, there's a sort of a, what do you call it, a, a porch there. I'm assuming that doesn't provide enough total um, because it's not, a, that side is not as good for the solar uh, panels. If it could be put there instead, I would be happy with that. But I imagine that's not possible. So I, I'm, you know, mind to approve it as they are presenting. Okay. And was your question about the porch at the back, moving the ones from the front to the back porch? Is that what you were wondering? Yes. Okay. And I don't know, Corey, if uh, I know the st part. staff has talked a, a lot to the applicant about different ways to accommodate it here. That was Commissioner Devonshire's question before, and it was answered that it's it's a floor below and it's completely shaded by the house on the north side, so it wouldn't be viable. Thank you. Thank right, you. I, I, missed, I missed that. Thank you. Okay. I thought that question was about the lower roof in the front, but thank you for clarifying that. Okay. <laughs> Doesn't matter. It's, it's just, yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Goldblum. All right. Thank you. Uh, I, I look at these as um, same as wheelchair lifts and ramps. Uh, they are part of the law. They are required. They are a, a visible material representation of our reckoning with reality. And um, therefore, I think that it's uh, appropriate that it be visible. Uh, we've done it before on single family houses in, in Queens. I remember we did one uh, a few while ago, hard. a Tudor house. <clears throat> um, uh, I, I forget which district That's, that was in. It was Addisley Park. <clears throat> there you go, yeah. A uh, very similar situation to this. And uh, I think that this is, this is uh, completely appropriate and may we see many more. Thank you, Commissioner Devonshire. I find the present technology of solar panels to be um, regrettably obvious. I hate seeing them on buildings. Um, I, I think they are amazingly visually obtrusive but this is the state of the technology as it is today. Like um, looking at a 1920s console radio versus a cell phone, um, I, I would only hope that I would live long enough, it's not gonna happen of course, I would live long enough to see the technology um, that we're looking at today in that diminutive form, but it ain't gonna happen. And so I sell this to myself with the idea that it is reversible, amazingly <laughs> enough. And so I can live with it and I can approve it on this building. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Lutfi? I can approve this for, for all of the reasons everyone has discussed. <laughs> okay, Commissioner Jefferson? Yes, um, I can approve this. My, my only drawback is, you know, I mean, the low profile works well and it follows the, the slope of the roof. It's the valleys that becomes a problem. And if there was some way that the manufacturers could work and kind of looking at this type of structure and working with the valleys of it, have a portion of it covered, um, would be an advantage for them. I can approve this. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Gustafson. I wish we could put a timeline on uh, Commissioner Devonshire's uh, point there because, uh, you know, if there's no way to put manufacturers' feet to the fire, we're going to continue to see these for a long, long time. And I'm loath to use uh, Commissioner Devonshire's uh, lifeline as the measure. Um, so um, I, I, can, I can approve this as is, but I'm um, getting less 
um, interested in doing that as time goes on and we don't see any changes. <coughs> Okay, thank you. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Yes, I, I'm not clear why it is that the um, solar uh, shingles are not as efficient and are not the sort of a standard that we want to push these um, buildings in historic districts to, uh, to use. So my preference in every case would be the shingle type um, and and I'm um, and again I, I don't have an understanding of whether or not though the efficiency can be improved, um, but I find it appropriate uh, as is. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Holford Smith. I can find this appropriate. I think it's important that we move towards great uh, clean energy and and that it be visible. So I find it appropriate. Okay, thank you. All right, so I think we can make a motion to approve it. Um, Commissioner Chapin, are you comfortable with making the motion? Uh, yes. Okay, in the matter of LPC 2108923, 1723 Newkirk Avenue, Ditmas Park uh, Historic District. Colonial Revival Style Freestanding House designed by RJ Schaefer and built in 1913. Application is to install solar panels. I note that the building style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Ditmas Park Historic District. I also note that the installation of visible solar panels on pitched roofs of freestanding houses may be unavoidable in cases such as this one due to code requirements, site conditions, and the necessity of the panels to face south for proper performance and economic viability. I recommend approval finding that the installation of the proposed solar panels and framing will not damage or eliminate any significant features of the roof, which is currently covered with modern asphalt singles. That most of the solar panels will be placed on the rear slope of the roof and seen in conjunction with the garage and rear facade of this in the adjacent building. And the small installation on the front slope will be in an area that is subservient to the prominent gable end and will not overwhelm the roof or detract from the front of the building. That the solar panels will have a low profile and will be mounted parallel to the pitch of the roof, thereby roof maintaining the roof plane. That the simple rectilineal rectilinear configurations and dark uniform appearance of the solar panels and framing elements will have a neutral presence on the roof. That the installation of the solar panels will be reversible in the long term and will be clearly be visually differentiated as a modern renewable energy installation and that the proposed work will not detract from the special architectural and historic character of the building and the Ditmas Park Historic District. Thank you, and Commissioner Goldblum, would you second that motion? Second. Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. <clears throat> Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. With nine in favor, none opposed, the motion passed. All right, that's approved. Thank you. And perhaps you can talk to the manufacturer about starting to think about colors and size and other ways to modify the technology for different site specific uses. But in the meantime, this is approved and we wish you well. And that concludes our morning session. And we will now break for lunch for a half an hour. We will come back at 1.10 uh, and uh, resume the afternoon schedule. Thank you all. So we'll ask all members of the public to voluntarily exit the meeting and rejoin at 1.10 so that we don't uh, have to remove you, which could cause technical problems when you try to return. Commissioners just need to turn your audio and video off. Thank you.